Uh, greetings from the Space Shuttle Columbia to the International Space Station Alpha. It's great to be up here in orbit with you. We're glad uh, to be along, uh, sharing some time, flight time in space. How are you doing today? Uh, thank you, great. Uh, we just to change our show. So what about you? We can see that you have today yellow and green. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, hopefully you're getting a good uh, length with us. Yeah, you guys look great. Must be... Uh... Must be good to be getting out of those uh, those spacesuits for for a change and into some uh, regular clothes. Looks like you're having a good uh, good day. It's been uh, it's been a very busy time, but you're right. We're having a little bit of uh, kickback relaxation time today, and I think the whole crew is appreciating that. Hey, before I forget, I don't know if you heard it yesterday. We just want to say congrats to uh, Digger and Mike for their uh, first flights, and and uh, congrats to. Uh, Rick and, and also Mike for the first TVAs and uh, congrats to, to all of you again. Um, I'm sure you've heard this too many too many times, but uh, you all have had a uh, great mission and uh, we wish you all a, a, a nice uh, soft uh, navy landing. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Dan. It really is a thrill to be up here. A dream come true. Uh, it's been a great flight and great to fly with uh, these folks here and uh, just uh, just a wonderful experience uh, and a great first. Welcome back to Next at CNN. Astronomers here at UC Berkeley have joined the search for intelligent life in the universe. Using a 40-inch telescope at the Lick Observatory, they're scanning the skies looking for brief pulses of artificial light, which may have been sent by aliens, tens, even hundreds of light years away. Meantime, another tool to search the heavens, the Hubble Space Telescope, is about to get an upgrade. The Space Shuttle Columbia took off from a chilly Kennedy Space Center carrying seven astronauts on a service call to the orbiting telescope. Miles O'Brien reports on the Hubble's checkered past and promising future. You're looking at Hubble Mission Control. Astronomers here have borne witness to a 24 by 7 stream of cosmological revelation for about a decade now. Amazing, isn't it? Launched with a flawed mirror and myopic vision, at first Hubble didn't just rhyme with trouble, it embodied it in epic proportions. Astronomer Ed Weiler was there for it all, including the day in December of 93 when the first 2020 image appeared on the screens. We knew we had redemption from, from go, going from a national joke that the nighttime TV hosts were, you know, using us to, uh, we did it, we fixed it. And then the rest is history. We went from a national disgrace in some people's minds to a symbol of the great American comeback. Hubble came back to prove black holes existed and found them all over the place. It found hints of solar systems like our own, and it showed us how the universe looked 10 billion years ago when galaxies were toddlers. If Hubble is seeing the uh, seven or six-year-old kids, uh, the new camera will get us back maybe to the three or two-year-olds. That new camera, the main reason for this trip, will be 10 times stronger than the one it replaces. Seven astronauts, the fourth crew to service Hubble, will be there for a week, ticking off a long to-do list of telescope improvements during five arduous spacewalks. It's an incredibly challenging mission, and yet one with an incredible reward as we look at Hubble and extending its reach. Not to mention its depth. Every Hubble image ever beamed back to Earth is here in this room. It used to be they were stored on disks this size in machines which filled up the room. Today, the disks are a lot smaller, as you might suspect, and so are the machines. But don't let the size fool you. Inside here is seven and a half terabytes of Hubble data. To put that in some perspective, the entire Library of Congress consists of 10 terabytes. The sum total of all the data we have is pretty impressive. But wait, there's more. Hubble's successor, the so-called Next Generation Telescope, will orbit much farther from Earth and use infrared cameras to capture the universe at the beginning. That's eight years away, but don't count Hubble out even then. Because Hubble is so powerful, there's a lot of science buried in those observations. Even when Hubble is gone, it most certainly will not be forgotten. We head up into space, hurtling around the planet at about 350 miles in altitude, 17,500 miles an hour. Of course, it doesn't feel that way is the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia, which has had an excellent week in space. And let's start with the uh, commander who's front and center, uh, Scott Scooter-Altman. And Scooter, I've got to ask you, a week ago, if we were talking, 
We'd be talking about a problem with a cooling system on the orbiter, the possibility of a shortened mission. Uh, is there any lingering concern about that cooling system, and how gratified are you that you got through the week? Well, you know, there's always uh, the concern that something could change, but we are incredibly uh, happy and, and grateful that we were able to stay up here. There was a lot of concern a week ago, and it's great to now be able to look back and see how much that's turned around and what a success the mission has uh, become. All right, let's send it over to John Grunsfeld, who confessed to me once he's a Hubble hugger. There, you, there I said it. He's out with it now. He's a Hubble hugger. And, uh, John, this is, you're, the, you're the only return spacewalker on this mission. A uh, lot of things to accomplish. As you look back on it, uh, what was the hardest moment for you? Was it that change out of the power control unit? I think, Miles, it was the change out of the power control unit. And, uh, you know, Rick did a terrific job in, in getting the box, uh, the old PCU, uh, out of the telescope. And I started mating up connectors, and I got about two-thirds of the way up. And there were one or two connectors that had a, a big bundle of wires in front of it. And I, I just kind of sat back and started laughing uh, because I thought this is never going to work. And uh, we persevered and were able to get all the connections up. And uh, it turned out to be, I think, our shortest day. And uh, we're really just happy that the PC worked out so well. Send it up to uh, Jim Yeah, Newman. I just have to jump in and Jim say Buckley. kudos to Jim Newman for saving that day. He saw the malfunction with John's suit to help uh, get him out of that and into another one. And so I was worried we were going to lose a whole day of EDA right then, and I think uh, his quick actions and everybody's uh, support jumping in there really saved it. We were about to step out. Uh, John Grunfeld's suit sprung a leak, quite literally, some of the cooling water that runs through it. Jim, uh, what went through your mind at that time? Was it was there time to think, or did you just get the, get the towels out and get to it? Uh, the first thing that went through my mind is to immediately let everybody know that we weren't going to be going out in the next few minutes as we thought we were going to, and that we needed to assess the situation so we could get Houston on board with us as part of the team to help us make some good decisions about where to go next. I was sure we weren't going out right away. I was scared we wouldn't go out at all that day, but Houston let us do a relatively quick turn and press on with the EVA, which was very successful. We're very grateful. That's your timeline back by only a couple of hours. No worse to the wear as a result. Mike Massimino, a rookie astronaut, rookie spacewalker, obviously. Um, we, we had all nervous on that first go-round being uh, around a $2 billion telescope. Uh, you know, you just don't want to break it, because if you break it, you own it, right? Well, uh, yeah, I was... Um I was uh, a little nervous and uh, uh, wondering what was going to happen, but what made me feel better about it, Miles, was I had a real good partner, my buddy with me out there. I knew uh, Jim and I can work well together. That made me feel a lot better. I knew we were going to have John and Rick looking after us on the checklist inside, and Scooter and Digger watching us, and Nancy flying me around on the arm, and, of course, all the folks down in Mission Control looking after us. So when I thought of it as a team effort, that made me feel a lot better. I knew the suits were good. We were going to be safe in the suits, and everyone was watching out for us, so that made me feel better about it. All that said, though, uh, I knew I really needed to be careful um, that uh, you know the actions that we were going to be taking out there were going to be important, and we had to be real careful with every move to make sure that we did the right thing, and uh, as a result, uh, it, we did, and uh, it was really a, just an incredible experience. Well, I know you got to feel better when you have guys with names like Scooter and Digger running the show. Let's move it over to Nancy Curry who is running that 50-foot robotic arm. Nancy is a, an Army helicopter pilot, which she says makes it easier for her to do her job. What's it like, though, having a person on the end of that arm, sort of like a human socket wrench, Nancy? Is it uh, a nerve-wracking job, or do you sort of get into it and it becomes an extension of your arm almost? Yeah, I think that's pretty well said. It really becomes an extension of me. And John said it best the other day that uh, I was connected to the hand controllers, which were manipulating the arm, which was connected to John, which at one point was connected to Rick maneuvering him. And uh, if that didn't epitomize the team effort on this crew, I'm not sure what did throughout the entire mission. The thigh bone's connected to the knee bone and all that kind of stuff. Rick Linehan, um, how was it for you out there on that power control unit change out? Uh, it seems, I'm just watching that, you know, that helmet-mounted camera video, 
trying to get those gloves in there. It seemed incredibly difficult. I, I wonder if, if at the end your hands are almost raw. Well, Miles, uh, as John said, uh, when we first opened the door to the TCU, uh, we were a little, uh, I guess we're taken aback because uh, the, the uh, uh, cables at the top of the TCU were out a bit farther than what we were used to training on, and so we wondered if we could uh, get the cables off. As it turns out, uh, due to the extreme uh, low temperatures uh, up here, the cables are very stiff. Uh, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was tough uh, to get the uh, cables to bend back and get the connectors back. And uh, as you can see in the helmet cam, uh, you, had, you had the same view I did. Uh, I, I, I had uh, a bit of trouble trying to get the cables in, and I kind of protected the connectors in my hand. And once I had them, I was able to bring the connectors back and put them in a special board to uh, restrain them so John could get them to put back later. So we were very happy that uh, everything went as well as it did. We had a good time, and uh, I'm just uh, just thrilled that uh, Hubble was uh, living and breathing again. All right, now final thought, I guess we, we got to give the pilot an opportunity to talk. The pilot never gets to talk. He does all the hard work on the TV. I'm told I'm out of time, but just briefly, Digger Carey, is it a sad moment leaving that Hubble behind? Well, uh, I, I guess it is a little bit because it's, it's so visually appealing to look at. But uh, um, more than that, it's it's happy to see it leave, and, and it's, uh, it was a happy feeling to see it leave in such good shape. I mean, as these guys were putting in the new parts, we were getting updates from the ground that uh, that the parts that they had put in were working correctly. And uh, I tell you, I just can't wait for the next couple of weeks when we start seeing images out of that beauty because I think it's going to roll everybody's stocks down. Kind of like eye surgery. you got to wait for the bandages to come off. Excellent work, guys. Great uh, and gal. Great week in space. Uh, thanks for joining us live from the flight deck of the Space Shuttle Columbia on their way back home early Tuesday morning landing. Thanks again to the... Rick Linehan used an experimental technique to try to revive a defunct camera on the Hubble telescope. NASA has called this one of the most difficult shuttle missions ever flown. But as Rick Linehan arrived via Columbia's robotic arm alongside the Hubble telescope, Mission Control were already declaring the previous spacewalks a big success. May need you to push on the handle to get it out? Maybe not. Okay. We'll see in a moment. So far, astronauts have attached solar power sensors onto the telescope and connected a new high-powered camera. With that under their belt, the final day's spacewalk is being treated more as an experiment than a repair. The two Americans have added a coolant system. It should revive an infrared camera that broke down three years ago. The machinery has been tested on an earlier shuttle flight, but never on a satellite. If it works, scientists will once again be able to use the telescope for studying star clusters, exploding stars and planetary atmospheres. Okay, both valves open and on their Velcro keepers. The astronauts will release Hubble from its mooring alongside the shuttle on Saturday and help guide it into a fixed orbit. Astronomers on Earth will spend the next few weeks bringing the new instruments back online. Assuming everything goes to plan, Hubble will begin transmitting the first images of distant galaxies later this month. Andrew Webb, BBC News. Good morning, and thanks for joining us on uh, your day off. This is Peter King along with Bill Harwood at CBS News KSC, and we'll start with John Grunsfeld. John, you've been calling the HST Mr. Hubble the Telescope through the mission as the unofficial Hubble spokesman. You seem to have given it somewhat of a human quality. How do you enjoy your return visit to the Holy Grail, and was it tough to let go yesterday? Well, I sure did enjoy the trip back to uh, Mr. Hubble the Telescope. It really was like seeing an old friend again, and uh, when we went into the app shroud, uh, and I think both uh, the space walking team of Jim Newman and Mike Nassimito and Rick Linehan and myself felt the same way, we uh, opened the doors to where the scientific instruments live, and it was kind of like going into a shrine. Uh, it was all clean and pristine, and, and we've been trained on taking care of those instruments as if they were uh, something very special, which they really are. Uh, the work on the telescope for me was just a dream come true, something I feel I've trained my whole life for. And indeed, when we set the telescope free on its mission of discovery yesterday, there was just a little bit of sadness in my heart that we weren't going to spend any more time with Hubble, but uh, a great sense of satisfaction that we'd made it a whole lot better. And I'm really excited about what's to come in the months and years uh, in the future when we find out uh, what the universe is made of and other really interesting stuff. Hey, John, 
easy for us to lose sight of the fact, I guess, that there's other great telescopes on the ground, the Keck, the Gemini North and South, the European Southern Observatory. Can you give us a little sense of what Hubble can do in its current state better than the ground can do and what the ground with adaptive optics and other technologies uh, does better than Hubble, kind of how they work together to do whatever it is that you guys are going to do? Well, there's a couple of things that Hubble does really well uh, that can't be done on the ground yet, and one of which is that Hubble being in Earth orbit can observe during the daytime. And so you're able to point at a single source in the sky, say some very, very distant galaxy, and look at it almost round the clock. Uh, and that's something that obviously the ground observatories can't do because as soon as the sun starts coming up or as soon as the galaxy sets in one horizon or the other, they have to stop observing. And so Hubble has that ability to look at a, an object for a long period of time. The pointing system on Hubble is also superb, and so it has is unrivaled in its ability to be very steady when it looks at a source. And anytime anybody's taking a photograph and the camera shakes a little bit and the, the image is blurred, uh, that's an inevitable consequence of being on planet Earth. Now, these very big telescopes like the Gemini uh, telescopes and the Keck telescopes and, and others that are coming online are rapidly uh, encroaching on Hubble's territory, but that's a good thing because the two types of technologies work very well together. You can do a, an initial discovery observation on the Hubble and then go follow up with one of the big light buckets. Uh, the limitations on the ground-based telescopes now are, are they really only work well in the infrared and red to make the kind of images that Hubble makes, whereas the Hubble works throughout the entire visible spectrum and also the infrared and ultraviolet. Uh, now that we've brought the NICMOS back to light, we can do the infrared again. Eventually, I think the technology will be there that the ground-based telescopes will be able to do most of what Hubble does, but it'll still have a very useful function, in fact, maybe still a leading function in uh, helping to expand the discovery space. And so I really have to stress that the telescopes all work together, and that's really the, the wonderful part of all this astronomy. Hey, John, I just one more quick one for you. I was just wondering how you think Hubble is going to be remembered in the history of astronomy someday, the significance of the instrument in 20th century science, early 21st century science. Well, I think of uh, Galileo turning his telescope to the skies as, as opening up the field of astronomy to a real science from, uh, from something of an art, really from doing astrometry of just learning the motion of the stars to actually starting to learn you know, what stars are made of. Uh, that was obviously quite a while ago, and, and we've come a long way since then. Uh, Hubble has really opened our eyes uh, to what the universe is made of, its structure, and has helped us learn how little we know about the universe. It's helped us explore the beauty of the universe in a way that uh, we've never been able to before in, in terms that people can see. And I think also the uh, explosion of the Internet has helped that by allowing distribution of all those images. When we look back, uh, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50 years from now, I think we'll see Hubble as the most productive scientific instrument in human history. It, it's had that big an impact, I think, on people's lives, but also on the field of science, uh, astronomy specifically. This is Peter again. This question is uh, for Nancy, who we haven't heard from yet this morning. Uh, this has been uh, a high-flying, uh, high-altitude flight. And you talked earlier with the ISS crew about uh, the view you got from up there. Talk to us a little bit about that and uh, the differences from the low-altitude flights or lower-altitude flights. Hey, uh, this is my fourth mission, and uh, I've flown at 160 miles, 260 miles, 215 miles, and now up at 315. Without a doubt, it is the most spectacular view from up here at 315 miles. You really get a lot of curvature of the Earth. You really get the just intense depth and breadth of colors at sunrise and sunset. Now, I've been spending my day off trying to capture those images on film, and I know that whatever images that I might take, it won't do it justice because it's just so truly awesome that it's indescribable. For Commander Altman, getting ready for landing, uh, any any special strategies, any special uh, worries about coming back here at night? Oh, the biggest strategy is a nice smooth touchdown right on uh, the numbers. That's my plan. For uh, Digger, as we run, it, we're running out of time here, but you were probably the most anonymous member of the flight crew, except we love the Daily Digger show. You've got a future. We're just wondering how your space experience has been. That's, it's just been a, a learning experience the whole way, and I, my hat's off to the veterans for uh, being so patient with uh, Mike Massimino and I. We've been bumping into them a lot and, and uh, causing little bits of trouble here and there, but uh, they've all been there, and they remember what it's like, and they're very patient. They're teaching us the ropes. We really appreciate it. 
great. Well, uh, to the crew of Columbia, we appreciate the time this morning. Enjoy the rest of your flight. Safe landing. We'll see you back here at KSC in a couple days. It's been great talking to you, and we're all really looking forward to uh, getting home, seeing the families and uh, all our friends and supporters. So thank you so much. Well, good morning and welcome to our mission status briefing for today to preview what we expect will be Columbia's homecoming to the Kennedy Space Center early tomorrow morning. With us today to preview entry and landing is the entry flight director, John Shannon. John. Hey, thanks, Rob. It is uh, it's time to bring this incredible mission to a close. Uh, and towards that end, the, uh, the crew got up this morning. Their uh, primary focus of the day was to prepare the, uh, the orbiter, both inside and outside, for entry tomorrow. Uh, they have, uh, the commander and pilot have done their exercise for the day. They worked through stowing all of the equipment, uh, getting the mid-deck lockers all closed up. Uh, and about two hours ago, they ran through all of the um, entry and landing systems checks that, uh, that we perform traditionally on the day before entry. Uh, you may have heard that so we had one uh, small uh, problem during that. Uh, that was when we test fired all of the thrusters that we would use during the uh, deorbit. Uh, one of the thrusters uh, that's used uh, for yaw steering control uh, failed. It is uh, not significant to us. There are four of those thrusters that point in that, uh, that direction. Uh, we require one of them, we like to have two of them, so right now we have three and we're, we're very happy with that configuration. Um, the plan for uh, tomorrow morning when, we, uh, when we're going to try and uh, enjoy our entry uh, is to run through the nominal deorbit uh, preparation timeline and the normal entry timeline. There are no impacts to the, um, to the degradation in the uh, cooling from the Freon loop number one that we've talked about several times during the course of this mission. There are no uh, procedure changes at all uh, related to that problem, so the uh, the crew will press to their procedures just as they've been trained. Uh, for tomorrow, we have uh, two opportunities to Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the first one would uh, land at 4.32 Eastern Standard Time. If we didn't come home that rev, we would come home the next one. That would land at 6.13 Eastern Standard Time. Both, of course, are, uh, are not landing. The, um, uh, Edwards Air Force Base site in California is not called up for tomorrow. We have uh, three wave off days worth of consumables. The shuttle program decided that we would uh, just try Kennedy Space Center for tomorrow and the weather out there supports it. Right now the uh, end of mission forecast is uh, calling for a pretty good chance of, uh, of coming home. They're uh, calling for clouds. Few clouds at 3,000 feet, a few clouds at 6,000 feet, scattered clouds at 12,000 feet. The only uh, potential flight rule violation we have is a slight chance of some showers forming over the Gulf Stream uh, and out over the water. The uh, forecasters at this time do not anticipate those coming on land and jeopardizing the, uh, the chance of us uh, being able to deorbit and enter. We will, uh, we will follow that. Uh, if we do not uh, land for some reason uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we would reassess whether Edwards Air Force Base would be called up for Wednesday opportunities. Uh, the current forecast for Kennedy Space Center on Wednesday is significantly worse than it is tomorrow. Uh, there's a low pressure system forming over the central United States that we expect to impact Kennedy Space Center, so there would be lower clouds, potential for rain, maybe some fog. Um, so we will assess that if we do not uh, land on either rev uh, tomorrow at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, from consumables, I said we have three wave off days. That's true. So our, our must land day would be Friday morning. Uh, and the limiting consumable for that is, uh, is both cryogenics and orbiter propellant. Uh, that is all, uh, all I have. Okay. We'll take questions here in Houston before going down to the Cape. And we'll start off with Mark Corot. Uh, thanks. Uh, Mark Corot from Houston Chronicle. I had a question regarding the, uh, the Freon cooling loop, and it has to do with how you'll treat this post-landing. Do you have to expedite the troubleshooting on that for the next mission to see if there's any generic problem or a ground handling problem, or will you handle that in the normal flow and not really have to be concerned about that? 
Um, Mark, I know there's a great deal of interest uh, in the shuttle program to understand exactly what the failure mechanism was. There's been a lot of theory that uh, in all the significant modifications that were done to OV-102 to Columbia uh, during the uh, orbiter major mod period that a piece of braze got in there and, and may have blocked one of the restrictors. Uh, but that's just theory, and I know they're going to want to, uh, as a as a normal course in the turnaround, to uh, to go in and X-ray it, find out what the uh, contamination was, and uh, and verify that there was uh, uh, no other generic problem that could affect any of the other orbiters. Uh, we have felt very confident on this flight after we got the initial blockage uh, that we were not going to have any further degradation because of the acid environment uh, shakes the vehicle so much. We felt that if there was any other contamination in there, that it would have shown up at that time. Uh, and that has borne out to be true. There has been uh, no additional degradation on Freon Loop 1, and Freon Loop 2 has been rock solid. So I expect that the uh, program will uh, will want to dig into Freon Loop 1, understand it uh, fairly quickly after the mission. Okay, thanks. And uh, I don't know if it's possible to sort of probe on the weather call uh, Tuesday or not, but does it look kind of clear cut or 50 50 at this chance, or is there any way to really? Go with that. Well, you've been out to Kennedy Space Center and seen the weather, so I'd, until we're uh, about uh, an hour from landing, I don't feel like giving odds on it. But the forecast was was pretty good. Um, the only uh, uh, potential concern right now that the weather forecasters have are the rain showers. The way our rules are set up is we don't like to have rain showers within 30 nautical miles of the uh, of the shuttle landing facility. The concern there is that you have on this flight that's actually 70 minutes from when you actually do your deorbit burn until you land. Uh, you don't want to have any rain showers that could move into your approach path. Um, so we'll look at those. Uh, if there are showers out there, we'll look very carefully at them. We'll see if, uh, if they're dissipating, uh, where they're headed, and, uh, and make the call. Okay, we're ready for questions from the Kennedy Space Center. Todd Halverson of Space.com. Um, John, I know the chances of problems with the Freon loops are, are remote uh, tomorrow, but I'm wondering if you can give me an idea of what the course of action would be, either on board or on the ground, if you saw a severe degradation in loop one or if loop two just failed off completely. Uh, does it, would that involve switch throws in the cockpit or commands going up to the orbiter? How would that be handled? Sure. Uh, they're really two completely separate cases. Uh, we have on the books procedures if one Freon loop fails. And basically what you do is you power down a lot of the equipment in the crew cockpit because you don't want a big heat load in that cockpit. Um, the degradation on Freon loop one is on the aft cold plate, which is all of the uh, avionics boxes that are in the back of the vehicle, the things that control the aero surfaces, the rate gyro assemblies. Uh, the APU controllers, all of those boxes are in the aft. So if we lost Freon Loop 1, if it, if it degraded further, if it failed, uh, we would go through our normal procedures and power down equipment in the crew cockpit and then proceed with the landing. If Freon Loop 2 failed, now that's a different case. We would go through and we would power down the things in the crew cockpit because you're still concerned about that heat load, but we have a reduced flow in the aft. Because of that reduced flow, we put together a procedure to basically power up the, the systems that are in the app that are on that cold plate about 30 minutes later than they normally would have been powered up. What that does is it reduces the total heat into the system and would allow us to do a normal entry. So we would run the loss of one Freon loop power down procedure that turns off the crew cockpit gear to reduce that heat load for either failure. Uh, if Freon Loop 2, the good Freon Loop, failed, we would also power or delay power up of the equipment in the aft because of that reduced flow. I hope that was clear. Thanks. That helps a lot. And just a quick follow, um, could, could you give me an idea of uh, what equipment would be associated with uh, Loop 2? Well, each Freon Loop redundantly cools all of the equipment. So there is not equipment on loop two and then equipment on loop one. They both uh, cool each of the gears. It's like it's just like a plate that has has Freon tubes running in it. It's got tubes from loop two and from loop one. Um, so 
the equipment you, that you would turn off if you lost either pre-owned loop would be the same. Columbia, this is JSC PAO. How do you hear me? JSC, uh, Space Shuttle Columbia has you loud and clear. How do you hear us? We have you loud and clear. Thank you. We'll begin questions here in Houston. If uh, you'd please uh, wait for the microphone and remember to state your name and affiliation. Uh, Mark? Uh, this is Mark Corot from the Houston Chronicle, and my question is for Commander Altman. Could you uh, describe or characterize uh, the mission in terms of its success in your mind, and could you tell us whether you and your crew are exhausted, exhilarated, or some of both? Hey, Mark, uh, it's great to talk to you again. Uh, you know, as I look back over this mission, uh, we had kind of a, a rough start. Everybody came together. The team really responded. And from that point on, from the time we had the France failure, it's been an uphill climb. We've worked incredibly hard, uh, been very busy, but also, I think, incredibly successful. And I just couldn't be prouder of the whole team, both all of us up here and the folks down there who worked so hard to make this a success. And yes, you're right, we are exhausted, but we are also exhilarated. Unbelievable that uh, we got everything we set out to do accomplished. We're really thrilled about that, and we're looking forward to coming home and sharing some more with everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a second question for John Grunsfeld, please. Could you give us uh, a little description of the telescope as you saw it? I'm thinking uh, it's sort of middle-aged or a little more at this point, and I wonder what your thoughts are on its mechanical condition and its ability to stand up for uh, eight more years. Well, that's a great question, and you know, I can say without reservation that, that Hubble is, is aging very gracefully. The, uh, the exterior of the telescope looks a little worse for wear, and that's just a result of the solar ultraviolet radiation, the atomic oxygen, the uh, outside multi-layer insulation is degrading a little bit and peeling back. But inside, Hubble is, is as good as gold. It's, uh, you open up and it's one of the uh, scientific instrument bays and the telescope looks absolutely brand new. Uh, all of the detectors look in great shape. Uh, even when we open the power control unit bay, uh, it looked probably as, as in good a shape or maybe even a little better than when it was launched. Uh, it's just amazing uh, how new the telescope looks inside. And Columbia, this is JSC PAO. Please stand by for KSC PAO. Okay. Uh, this is Phil on Earth News uh, for the five foot one inch uh, astronaut up there. Um, one of the teachers you invited down here for the launch uh, gave his students an assignment to um, do research on the shuttle's uh, subsystems, and I figured I'd help them out with one of their assignments. Can you tell us about the, uh, how you guys remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, both uh, from the shuttle crew cabin and also from your spacesuits? Well, in both cases, we use uh, lithium hydroxide canisters. Uh, there's a removable device inside the uh, back of the uh, primary life support system in the EMU. Uh, I guess I'm probably the least qualified to answer that question, but uh, with the four EVA uh, superstars around me. But we use the same uh, solar system here in the shuttle. Uh, in fact, uh, once a, in the morning and once in the evening, we change those out to scrub out the CO2, especially as we uh, exercise and move around and uh, with these six big guys behind me. And for Rick Linehan, after two flights inside, you finally got to go outside, and I heard uh, the excitement in your voice as you went out for the first time. Oh, what was it like? What was the view? How did it compare with your anticipation uh, for what you thought it would be like? Uh, it was everything I expected and more. It was uh, fantastic. This is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press, perhaps for John Grunsfeld. Um, you worked so hard and long for this mission, and I'm wondering, is there a bit of an emotional letdown now that it's all over and you're headed home? I wouldn't exactly call it an emotional letdown. I'm still uh, still riding high on, on the fact that we did everything we came to do and that we didn't break the telescope. That's always a, a big fear going into a complex mission like this is that you arrive at a, at a Hubble Space Telescope that's working very well in the hopes of making it much better and that something doesn't go well. But fortunately, uh, you know, we did put a lot of work into this and the, the team on the ground was excellent in their support and we did everything we came up to do. I'm a little saddened, you know, seeing Hubble go. It's kind of like seeing a, a friend 
they're parts that you know you won't see for a long time, if, if at, at all ever. But uh, as far as the work we did, you know, there's there's really no letdown. I'm just thrilled that everything was done, and I can't wait to see the images from the advanced camera in, in a month or so. Um, perhaps for one or more of the other spacewalkers, um, I'm one, maybe the one who had the most physically demanding job, whatever that was. How strenuous or physically exerting uh, was the spacewalking, and do you think it would have been humanly possible for the same person to do two or even three of these particular spacewalks on consecutive days? I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to some of the other guys, too, but we had a couple of tasks and they were uh, of a, a rather different nature. The first one that I think was one would consider difficult was the power control unit, and that was just the sheer number of connectors and the very limited access. And some of the connectors uh, where we had to reach quite far into the uh, telescope with very limited access for our hand uh, had the stiffest cables. And so that was one of trying to manage a combination of uh, fatigue, forearm fatigue, and also frustration. You know, the key there was not ever to get frustrated at being able to put on a connector. You know, I just had to pace myself and, and make sure that the telescope didn't get the better of me. Uh, the second one is when we tried to put on the uh, NICMOS cooling system radiator, and uh, that turned out to be a bit of a challenge, so I'll hand that up to Rick. Uh, as Don said, uh, the cryo cooler was uh, was the last EVA that we did, and uh, it was uh, fairly physically demanding. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of intricate work inside, uh, and it's funny uh, the uh, radio was uh, was difficult to get on because of some uh, some of the things that happen in space aren't quite like they are in 1G, obviously, and uh, minor loads that you would uh, be able to react against uh, on the ground are more difficult to work with in space because your body just uh, pushes away from the load. But inside the telescope uh, actually uh, was more difficult than I thought it would be because you have to spend so much, uh, so much mental, uh, I guess, uh, power and uh, uh, always trying to figure out where you are and not react against something and not push off too hard so you bang into something. So in, in, a, in effect, I thought it was more exerting inside just from uh, the inputs I had to make to make myself stay perfectly still than actually it was to work on the outside of the telescope, both mentally and physically for me inside because there was a high stress level involved, and I'm sure Jim would say the same when they were working with ACS. When you're in the scope, it's almost like a surgical OR. You don't want to drop anything. You want to be exquisitely careful in terms of how you move and what you do. Um, this is Steve Seislaw from Florida today. Um, my first question is for Nancy, and that is um, when you were maneuvering the uh, arm around, you did some work with the telescope and some work with the spacewalkers. Um, did you feel more pressure to handle the telescope delicately or, or your spacewalkers? I'm getting a lot of grief for that question, but uh, actually, um, you know, there's a high level of stress for both. Um, obviously, if we didn't grapple the telescope, there wouldn't have been five EVAs, and so it started with that. And I just kind of looked at it as one step at a time, and uh, especially as a flight engineer also, I just took it one day at a time, one step at a time, and focused on the task for that day. But uh, yeah, I would be uh, absolutely uh, untruthful if I didn't say I wasn't nervous on grapple day, uh, because uh, grappling a free flyer, um, is probably one of the more difficult things we do with the arm, although it is uh, always on my mind that i got a human being on the end. Basically, at one point, Jim uh, called himself an end effector as we were putting in the uh, advanced camera for survey and uh, basically driving him in with the arm. Thanks. And um, for the commander, um, this was your first, uh, your first flight as commander. Did you feel any real pressure to to maybe uh, jump into a spacesuit yourself or take over the robot arm earlier than you were supposed to? Uh, everybody just uh, did so well. They trained so hard and worked so hard up here. Uh, 
I probably had the easiest job of all. I just got to sit back and watch everybody do their jobs. And it's a great uh, team effort, both on the ground and up here. I just can't thank everybody enough, uh, from my crew to the, the whole support staff at Houston. Um, Todd Halverson of Space.com for Scooter. In terms of the uh, Freon loop number one situation, I am wondering what your cockpit displays will show you, whether they would enable you to monitor flow rates within that particular loop, and if you have any lingering concerns about that situation. Well, we do have indications uh, here, you know, as well as all the data the ground has, but we see the aft uh, coal plate basically is a black box, and we get a flow rate indication through that. Uh, and we've monitored that and looked at it. It's remained basically stable through the flight. I know uh, ECOM on the ground uh, has probably been staring at that number as well, alert to let us know if there was any degradation. But uh, we're really happy with the shape of Columbia. It's worked out fine from a few nervous moments uh, to a big success. I think uh, we're all just elated that we got to stay up here and complete the mission. And just a quick follow on that, what um, actions would be required on either the part of you and Digger or the ground if you for some reason had to switch over to uh, loop two and fly solely on that? And what would be the upshot if both loops for some reason went down after the deorbit burn? Well, uh, I guess the quick answer is we'd all get very warm. Uh, the shuttle actually works on both Freon loops all the time, so if you lose one, you have to start shutting equipment off. If you lose both, you've got to get on the ground as soon as possible. So if something like that had happened, that was the big concern. Would the one degraded cooling loop have enough capability to get us to the ground with all the equipment and redundancy that we needed? And the ground decided, looking at the rates, that it would. We were uh, capable of a next worst-case failure, and that's uh, what allowed us to stay up here the rest of the time. Uh, Bill Harwood with CBS with a question for, I guess, Jim Newman. Uh, Jim, I was just curious um, how fatiguing five spacewalks is. And I know you had a six spacewalk as a contingency. Um, I know the Hubble guys probably would have loved to have gotten a gyroscope on. I was just, I was just curious if six is really the limit or if, or if five is the limit or how you assess your fatigue factor with that many outings. Well, what I think, uh, Bill, is that it uh, comes down to getting into a rhythm and knowing your job. And so what I found on this flight was that although – uh, five was fatiguing. We ended up in a uh, in a good rhythm. The key to maintaining margin, though, would be to add a uh, a day of rest in between, in order to maintain the pace. And then, if you do that occasionally, you could continue, uh, perhaps indefinitely. But I think, as far as in a row, five is uh, was a good number. I thought we still had margin on the last spacewalk. If we had needed to, Mike and I could have gone out on a sixth spacewalk to accomplish mission success tasks, and, uh, and there would have been a sufficient margin for us to do that safely. Thanks. And let me ask uh, Mike Massimino a question. I, uh, you know, going into this mission, everybody had us so convinced that this was the most complicated mission in the history of the world uh, that there was a reasonable chance that you wouldn't get everything done, and then you got up there and made it look easy. So I guess, I guess my question is, should we believe you next time you tell us it's that complicated? Uh, my, my reference is only for this one, and what I what I found was is that we were really well prepared. Uh, we had a great team on the ground to get us ready, and a lot of experience with the Hubble team uh, from the Goddard Space uh, Goddard Space Flight Center and from around the country, the folks that helped us get ready, and we had experience with John and the other uh, folks on the crew, uh, and I think those things combined uh, gave us a, a, a chance to to do well and. Uh, I, it just seemed that once we got going, things things worked, and uh, the plan worked out well, and and uh, feel very uh, very happy that everything did go as well as it did. This is so Chen again uh, uh, for Rick Linehan. E each time you guys uh, pass over and I wave at you, I realize you're in a 28 and a half degree orbit. Uh, but with your altitude, have you been able to look at uh, uh, Pelham and Lowell and think about your friends up there? Have you been able to see th that area of New England and any thoughts about uh, the family and friends who are following the mission? Yeah, because of our in 
inclination, uh, we never did get as high as uh, New England, so, uh, but I was able to uh, look out several times from the window and out, out over my shoulder uh, and look right up the East Coast, and because uh, of the large, uh, well, our, our look down angle, uh, we are able to see quite, quite a bit off the plane, so I was able, uh, in many cases, uh, we were looking out the window one night and Scooter saw Chicago. Uh, I looked up and I could see uh, the uh, haze of Boston, the lights under the clouds, New York City, and uh, you know, right up the coast, uh, probably all the way, uh, if you had a clear day, to Nova Scotia. But um, uh, I was always thinking about my family and friends in New England, and uh, a lot of them came down for the launch uh, and talked to them on email. And I'm really looking forward, uh, Jim and I, and I think all of us, maybe to getting back up to the East Coast and then to the New Hampshire, uh, Cape Cod, New England area this summer after the launch, uh, excuse me, after the flight's over. And uh, for Nancy, same question, but uh, replace uh, Tom and Lowell with uh, Troy. Unfortunately, uh, we do believe we saw Chicago, but Troy's a little bit too small to see, uh, and uh, so unfortunately it won't be it. We weren't able to see that part of the country, but uh, we've had some spectacular viewing, and uh, Jim and I were having some recollections uh, yesterday during our half day off that uh, the view of the East Coast of the U.S. was as spectacular as we remember from our last flight. This is Steve Seisloff again from Florida today. Um, my question is for Jim, and that is um, since you've been spacewalking now on the station and the Hubble, um, which of your experiences stands out as the most uh, as your most memorable spacewalking uh, day? I think that each one is in its own uh, category of memories, its own uh, special place. The, uh, the when we put the NASA space station together and on its path there, uh, that was very very special. When Jerry and I went out, and as you know, Jerry's going out again next month on the station. Uh, doing Hubble, though, is a very special experience because it is such uh, an internationally known uh, piece of equipment. It's so productive and it's so demanding. So each one is uh, very special in its own way, uh, but they're both very different types of spacewalks. Thanks. And um, for Digger, which, um, I'm sorry, which um, day stands out for, for you? I mean, was this mission everything that you really expected it to be? Yes, everything and more. Um, in my mind, before the mission, I, I think I was thinking I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't accomplish all the objectives, but uh, it's uh, we went out there and, and did it, and we did it together, and, and I think as far as any particular day, the day that uh, probably jazzed me the most so far would be Rendezvous Day. It was uh, just such a thrill after all the, the training we've had to see that, that happen for real, and to, uh, there was one point when when Hubble was still quite a ways out, and, and uh, Skr had me go back and look out the overhead window, and there's this beautiful golden star, and uh, I just couldn't believe it was happening. It seemed like it seemed like a dream. Uh, this is Marcia Dunn, the uh, Associated Press again for one of the spacewalkers. I'm, I, I just wanted to sort of follow up on my earlier question. Given how um, challenging these spacewalks are. What's the most uh, in a row that you think any single one person could have done um, going out on consecutive days? Just real quick, Marcia, from my own point of view, uh, I feel that any one of us could actually have gone out on consecutive days as many times as needed as long as the spacewalks were on the order of seven hours or less and that we didn't have suit malfunctions which extended the the uh, crew duty day, uh, an extra two hours. The fatigue level from the inside and outside is actually very similar and in some ways is more difficult when you're on the inside. When you're on the inside, it's all brain work. When you're on the outside, you're able to actually get a little exercise in as well, and we all know that that's refreshing. Let me also get, uh, get you John's input on that. This was... Uh a long series of EDAs, it's, you know, we spent more time doing EDAs, I think, than any other previous mission. And the, the key to our success really was a, a pacing. Uh, as Jim said, we did get into a rhythm uh, each night of getting the space suits turned around for the next day. I think five was, uh, was a good number. I think if, if we'd had to do a six at the same level, uh, you probably would have seen a few more, you know, errors. We probably would have trapped them and, uh, and corrected them promptly. But as each day goes on, I think you lose more margin. Uh, it, 
if you had a day off in the middle, I think that'd make all the difference in the world for everybody to kind of recollect their thoughts, rest a little bit, and uh, get ready to go again. For uh, for consecutive days, again, it's a question of margin. You know, I felt uh, after the first EVA when we were putting Mike and Jim in the suits that I felt really good. And uh, on the fourth EVA when we were putting Mike and Jim in the suits again after Rick and I had done the power control unit, my hands were still a little bit sore, but I felt like I could have gone out that day. And uh, on day six, actually our deploy day, I think everybody felt like if we had to do a, a rapid response EVA to help Hubble on its way, that uh, any of us could have done that. Uh, all that being said, though, uh, five was tough, and uh, we were glad that that's all we had to do on this trip. Uh, thank you. And, and for the commander, I'm wondering um, how you celebrated the success of the mission after the deploy or whether you were too ar tired to even uh, worry about much celebrating. Now that really was a tremendous uh, day to have the deploy go so well and then be able to uh, realize that our work with Hubble was really done. It was gone and we'd done everything. It was uh, a tremendous uh, celebration and sense of exhilaration that we were able to get all that accomplished. It was just amazing. And we did take a little bit of downtime and just look at the earth and kind of talk amongst each other about the highlights that we had and the the funny stories that we shared about uh, what had gone on. It was a, just a little bit of downtime to take a break and enjoy this mission. This is Phil Chen of Earth News for John. Uh, yeah, it was nice to see you guys to set the new record uh, for shuttle EVA duration. But any thoughts about the fact that EVA 3, which was supposed to be the longest, was actually the shortest, uh, coming in uh, under seven hours, and the other four were the ones which went long and went over seven hours? The power control unit change out when we uh, ran that in the pool as a team, it uh, it looked like it would be about a six and a half hour spacewalk. Uh, however, we had a lot of uncertainties based on just the sheer number of connectors that we had 36 connectors off, 36 connectors on, plus the batteries and all the covers. So we made an assumption that in all of those activities, that something might take a little bit longer. And so when we uh, put our best effort together to make a prediction on how long it would take, uh, we came up with a number that was closer to seven hours. And in the back of our minds, we always had this uh, this dream, if you will, that it would actually come out more like the NBL uh, water times. And, and in fact, it did. And I think that's just because of all the training we did between the NBL. We had a very high fidelity mock-up over in uh, Building 9 at the Johnson Space Center of just that one Hubble Bay that uh, Rick and I practiced a tremendous amount on. Uh, plus our trips up to the Goddard Space Flight Center where we tried it on the real PCU. And uh, I think all of that training uh, made it almost a, uh, a Zen-like uh, approach to, to being able to do those connectors in a smooth fashion, and, and it worked out great. And for Digger, unlike uh, virtually every other day, this mission, uh, this is the only PAO event where I believe you've only been asked one question so far. We've all enjoyed the Digger show, wondering uh, if you'd like a job working for CNN as a space reporter uh, after this mission's over. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I like my present job pretty good right now. <laughs> Thanks for the offer. <laughs> This is Steve Seislaw from Florida Today. Um, for Mike, the uh, the same question I asked uh, Digger, is it this, is this mission everything uh, you expected from it? Uh, yeah, it sure was, and, and a lot more. Um, I, I knew that it was going to be a great experience, and uh, that I was extremely fortunate to be part of this crew with, with these folks and part of the whole Hubble team. But uh, the memories I have from this uh, will last me forever. You know, just thoughts of being uh, being outside with uh, with Jim and uh, working with him and with the guys inside and and being flown around on the arm by Nancy and looking back into the cockpit and seeing Nancy and Scooter and Digger and and uh, working with us and uh, then looking over the horizon and seeing the Earth and and then also the work we did, uh, you know, concentrating on the different tasks and and those going well and getting it all done it was it was just just an awesome experience uh it's something something i'll never forget and these, i think these memories are going to stay with me for uh, forever thanks and um for for rick um for those couple hours when you were floating there in the airlock uh waiting for uh john to get his uh, second suit on 
what was what was going through your mind? I mean, was that a relaxing time to just take a nap at all, or, or what we what was going through your mind? Uh, actually, I guess I whistled a lot because uh, Nancy floated in with a camera and a big smile and started taking pictures of me. Yeah, I was. Uh, there was a lot of things going through my mind. At first, uh, when it happened, uh, I I actually thought that that might be it for the day and that we'd have to button it up and uh, see what we could do with the suits and try again. And uh, I was really impressed with Jim Newman and that he recognized the uh, fault right away, got everybody together as a team. Uh, they took John out of the suit, got the suit out, uh, cleaned that up, and immediately reconfigured uh, one of the other EMUs, actually Jim's own EMU. And uh, we've uh, got new arms on it to fit John and uh, got him back in the suit. And uh, I was amazed at uh, how little time it took. And, uh, uh, you know, Houston, I think, was too, because at that point they said we're go for the nominal EVA. And I guess I'm not quite sure, but all in all, I guess I spent maybe an extra uh, two hours, two, two, over two hours maybe in the suit. But uh, I was in the airlock the whole time, and I just was kind of re-familiarizing myself with the suit and uh, run up through all the procedures in my head. And so uh, maybe uh, maybe that helped, actually. And Columbia, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Roger, Houston, thank you. Uh, we enjoyed it. My name is Monty. To convince us that you are really in space, could you show us some fun things you can do when you are weightless in space that we'll not be able to do otherwise? Okay, well, uh, some of the things you can do, I guess, uh, are float things to each other. You can see a space shuttle uh, floating slowly across the shot. You can also uh, change your position if uh, you want, if there's not enough room down here, like it's crowded, you can turn upside down. And it's hard to hold that position in gravity without hurting your head. Hello, my name is Joshua Walker. My question is, did you experience any unexpected problems during your EVAs? If so, how did you solve them? Hi, yes, we did have one unexpected problem. On the third spacewalk, one of the spacesuits had a valve fail open, which resulted in a lot of water in the spacesuit. And if we'd have gone outside with that spacesuit, with all the water in it, it would have frozen up and probably broken uh, the spacesuit. Fortunately, we detected it before we went outside, and so we were able to clean up the water and to change out the spacesuit with a backup spacesuit that we had. It uh, cost us about two hours of time that day, but we all worked hard to, uh, to turn around the, the new spacesuit, and uh, we still got the spacewalk done that day. Columbia now approaching uh, Central Texas. We're expecting uh, to pick up uh, communications through the Merritt Island tracking station about four minutes from now, and about five minutes before landing, should uh, receive television views uh, over the shoulder of pilot Dwayne Carey through the pilot point of view camera as uh, Commander Scott Altman uh, completes his 228 degree turn around the heading alignment circle, the mythical point of reference that pilots use as they approach a landing site for alignment of their craft with the runway. Columbia now traveling 17 times the speed of sound at an altitude of about 39 miles, range to touch down 1,000 miles to the Kennedy Space Center, 15 minutes away from the end of the STS-109 mission.
Onboard computers guiding Columbia to the Kennedy Space Center. Touchdown now 14 and a half minutes away. Columbia traveling 15 times the speed of sound at an altitude of 35 miles. Descending at a rate of about 174 feet per second as it approaches um, the coastline of Louisiana and Mississippi. The density of Earth's atmosphere naturally slowing down Columbia, now traveling uh, at about 12 times the speed of sound, uh, descending uh, rapidly, now 33 miles in altitude, range to touch down 600 miles, all of Columbia's systems in excellent shape, three good auxiliary power units, three good fuel cells, all the Freon loops on Columbia holding steady, and uh, no issues associated with Columbia's return to Earth. Columbia now back out over the Gulf of Mexico at an altitude of 31 miles, range to touchdown 461 miles. Columbia will cross uh, the west coast of Florida, north of the Tampa St. Petersburg area near Apalachicola Bay. Again, uh, we're just 11 and a half minutes away from touchdown. Everything in good shape on board Columbia. A very quiet crew this morning. Commander Scott Altman and pilot Dwayne Carey on the flight deck, joined by flight engineer Nancy Curry and mission specialist Rick Linehan. Down on the mid-deck, Jim Newman, John Grunsfeld, and Mike Massimino. Columbia Houston, Energy, Ground Track, and Nav are go. Your touchdown is 3,100 feet at 195 knots. Copy 3,100, 195. Columbia Houston, take TAC in. The TACANs are three redundant tactical air navigation units aboard the orbiter receiving data from radio beacons located at the landing site. Uh, that data is processed uh, and fed to the general uh, purpose computers for use as the best, best available data for the guidance, navigation, and control officer here in Mission Control. Columbia right on the money, approaching the west coast of Florida. Time to touch down 10 minutes now. Range to touch down 264 statute miles. Columbia at an altitude of 26 miles, tra traveling seven times the speed of sound.
Columbia now crossing the west coast of Florida, eight and a half minutes before touchdown at an altitude of 22 miles, range to touchdown 163 miles across uh, the peninsula. Columbia descending at a rate of about 280 feet per second. The air data probes have been deployed. Uh, these are two uh, probes located on each side of the orbiter's nose containing pressure ports, which sense the impact and static pressures at various points, and the combination of all those readings used to calculate dynamic pressure and altitude, airspeed, Mach numbers, angle of attack, and rate of descent for the orbiter's general purpose computers. Infrared cameras at the Kennedy Space Center will soon uh, pick up the view of Columbia. Take air data. Houston, Columbia is taking air data. Columbia passing over central Florida at an altitude of 17 miles range to touchdown 80 miles from the Kennedy Space Center. There's the first view of Columbia approaching the landing site and also approaching the area called Terminal Area Energy Management where Columbia will be commanded through a final series of banking maneuvers to bleed off excess speed prior to its arrival at the heading alignment circle for navigational updates. Columbia now 68 miles from the Kennedy Space Center, 14 miles in altitude, traveling two times the speed of sound, soon will go subsonic, heralding its arrival at the launch site with a pair of twin sonic booms. Columbia Houston, you are on energy approaching the hack. There are no changes to winds or weather. You are a nominal shoot deploy. Houston, we copy nominal shoot deploy. Thank you. Pilot Dwayne Carey at the controls, uh, getting a few minutes of stick time before he hands it over to Commander Scott Altman. Columbia now at the heading alignment circle, time to touch down three and a half minutes.
An early morning wake-up call for the residents of the Florida Space Coast. Twin sonic booms as Columbia has gone subsonic. Commander Scott Altman now flying Columbia, executing an overhead right-hand turn of 250 degrees to align Columbia with runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center. Time to touch down three minutes. On final approach, Columbia will be descending at an angle seven times steeper than that of a commercial jetliner prior to the flaring of the shuttle's nose by the commander to burn off excess speed prior to landing gear deployment. You're now looking over the shoulder of pilot Dwayne Carey through the pilot point of view camera. You'll uh, see the runway in sight just a few seconds from now. Copy, Houston, on at 180. Commander Scott Altman now about three quarters of the way around the turn. Three miles in altitude. Columbia Houston on at the 90. Houston Columbia copies on at the 90. Thank you. Good view out of the pilot point of view camera. Altman now uh, aligning Columbia. You'll see the runway in sight. Columbia Houston on glide slope on center line. Houston, Columbia, field in sight on a beautiful night. We copy field in sight, Columbia. Columbia now perfectly aligned with runway 33. Again, the southeast and northwest approach to the three mile long landing strip. Altman now beginning to flare up Columbia's nose. Columbia over the runway, geared down and locked. Main gear touchdown. Carry deploying the drag chute. Nose gear touchdown. Columbia rolling out on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center, wrapping up a 3.9 million mile mission to improve the power and the vision of the Hubble Space Telescope. Columbia, Houston, we copy wheel stop. Welcome back, and we'd uh, like to congratulate you all on a very successful mission servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. We have no post-landing deltas.
Linda, thanks for joining us in this early morning. Well, first of all, Columbia, the Pioneer shuttle, almost 21 years after it was launched, uh, how did it behave during entry and landing uh, relative to uh, especially the uh, degraded Freon cooling loop issue? Columbia had a great entry with uh, no new failures. As you recall, during ascent shortly after main engine cutoff, we did have that Freon coolant loop one that indicated degraded flow through part of the loop, the aft cold plate portion. The flow through this loop remained stable for the entire flight and during entry. Linda, if you could assess for us uh, Columbia's overall performance uh, on its first flight back from over two years of major modifications. Columbia's performance was exceptional. The systems all performed um, in an outstanding manner with the exception of the degraded flow and Freon coolant loop one. We also had a reaction control system thruster that failed off but that was unrelated to the major modification. We had those a couple of those last flights, so we'll have to look into that after the mission. But I would say that overall Columbia's performance really was exceptional. And Digger, I'm sure you figured this out. Okay, Linda, and now because of the Freon cooling loop issue, which you'll have to address, uh, what uh, do you think in your mind will have to be done for, to prepare Columbia for STS-107 in the summer? And uh, is midsummer likely to be impacted by this post-flight maintenance? Uh, between this landing this Tuesday morning and the weekend case, he plans to complete some x-rays of that Freon coolant loop at two points in the line where the blockage is expected to be found. If they do find the blockage there, then that Freon coolant loop will be deserviced. However, the other loop, Freon coolant loop 2, will not need to be deserviced and can provide cooling for vehicle system. Therefore, the vehicle would not need to be powered down. If uh, they cannot find it in those two places, they'll have to continue with the x-rays. They also have ultrasonic and boroscopic methods that can be used to look in those lines. And if the blockage does is in a place common to both Freon coolant loops, then they would require deservicing both loops, which would mean powering down the entire vehicle. So um, hopefully we will find it in one of the first two places we look and only have to deservice that first uh, loop. If that is the case, then we may be able to meet the July 11th launch date for SGS 107. Uh, we'll have to assess the impact of that and also the thruster removal um, on the flow for that mission. Also, since we did land at KSC this morning rather than uh, in California, we don't have to ferry, so that buys us six days. Linda, on to this mission. Uh, you were the lead flight director for the last Hubble servicing mission back in December of 1999 over the Christmas time frame. And you, of course, know the euphoria affiliated with this type of success. If you could for us assess this mission, the spacewalks, how the flight came together to achieve such a huge technical triumph uh, for the world's astronomers. This mission was a huge success. All of the mission objectives plus a few extras were completed in the five spacewalks this flight. The telescope now has a new advanced camera for surveys, which provides about 10 times the capability of the old cameras, and also has a new cryocooler, which will allow resumption uh, of using Hubble's infrared cameras. There's really no way right now to measure the huge uh, technical triumph. It'll be uh, evident once HST gets uh, back operational and we can see the discoveries that it'll make. We'll see how valuable this mission really was then. But not lost, uh, not to be lost on uh, tonight's landing. Uh, this was the first time over the past 11 days that two separate spacecraft, the Shuttle Columbia and the International Space Station, were flown on two separate and very distinct missions from Mission Control here with separate and distinct objectives not tied into one another. Can you comment uh, or reflect on the significance of that, what that says about the multifaceted nature of the space program today? I think that was a significant milestone for both us and the station program. Uh, you also note that the SGS-107 mission uh, for Columbia, slated for July 11th, is a space hab mission, 16-day flight. That also will uh, be a mission that is decoupled with the space station. So we'll have another opportunity to do the same thing. I think it's uh, the way we'll be headed in the future, and um, it just worked wonderful. Mission Control Center held, held together quite well for the mission, and we could support both with no issues. And finally, Linda, looking ahead, uh, in a few weeks, we believe, STS-110 aboard Atlantis to bring the uh, center peace trust structure to the International Space Station. There have been some problems over the past week or so uh, associated with the station's robot arm and a wrist roll capacity. Uh, that arm, of course, required to mate the trust with the Destiny Laboratory. What, uh, what are you and the shuttle program doing in concert with the station program in assessing possible impacts to launching in early April? The station program continues to evaluate both uh, software and procedural workarounds to resolve the problem with the robotic arm uh, break problem. Uh, 
Today, we will roll that vehicle out at Atlantis to launch pad this morning at 7 a.m. on schedule so that we can support the launch date of April 4th. So both the shuttle and station programs are continuing to work to support that launch date. If we need to slip, of course, we will accommodate uh, whatever it takes for the station to get um, the robotic problem resolved. Okay, Linda Hamm, Shuttle Program Integration Manager, joining us this morning here at the Mission Control Center. Linda, congratulations on a great mission, and thanks very much. And thank you, and congratulations to you. Columbia, Houston, you'll be happy to hear that you've got to go to Doff Suits. Houston, that sounds good to us. Go to Doff Suits. Thank you. Columbia now at the heading alignment circle. Time to touch down three and a half minutes. An early morning wake-up call for the residents of the Florida Space Coast. Twin sonic booms as Columbia has gone subsonic. Commander Scott Altman now flying Columbia, executing an overhead right-hand turn of 250 degrees to align Columbia with runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center. Time to touch down three minutes. On final approach, Columbia will be descending at an angle seven times steeper than that of a commercial jetliner prior to the flaring of the shuttle's nose by the commander to burn off excess speed prior to landing gear deployment. You're now looking over the shoulder of pilot Dwayne Carey through the pilot point of view camera. You'll uh, see the runway in sight just a few seconds from now. Copy, Houston, on at 180. Commander Scott Altman now about three quarters of the way around the turn. Three miles in altitude. Columbia Houston on at the 90. Houston Columbia copies on at the 90, thank you. Good view out of the pilot point of view camera. Altman now uh, aligning Columbia. You'll see the runway in sight. Columbia Houston on glide slope on center line. Houston, Columbia, field in sight on a beautiful night. We copy field in sight, Columbia. Columbia now perfectly aligned with runway 33, again the southeast and northwest approach to the three mile long landing strip. Altman now beginning to flare up Columbia's nose. Columbia over the runway, geared down and locked. Main gear touchdown. 
Carry deploying the drag chute. Nose gear touchdown. Columbia rolling out on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center, wrapping up a 3.9 million mile mission to improve the power and the vision of the Hubble Space Telescope.
commander to burn off excess speed prior to landing gear deployment. The Space Shuttle Columbia ended its 11-day mission a short time ago, touching down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The seven-man shuttle crew spent the past week doing repair work and installing equipment upgrades to the Hubble Space Telescope. All told, the Hubble received nearly $200 million worth of new equipment. Columbia is the oldest of NASA's space shuttles. Lichtdenkmal. Anstelle des World Trade Centers leuchteten vergangene Nacht zwei gewaltige Lichtsäulen am New Yorker Himmel. Sie sollen an die rund 2830 Menschen erinnern, die am 11. September bei den Terroranschlägen auf die Wolkenkratzer getötet worden waren. Die Säulen werden einen Monat lang jeden Abend die New Yorker Skyline überragen. Das von 88 Scheinwerfern erzeugte Lichtdenkmal ist noch aus 30 Kilometern Entfernung zu sehen. Heute Morgen ist die US-Raumfähre Columbia nach elftägiger Reise auf dem Kennedy Space Center in Florida gelandet. Die siebenköpfige Besatzung hatte in der vergangenen Woche das Weltraumteleskop Hubble erfolgreich renoviert und mit neuen Instrumenten ausgestattet. Die Astronauten mussten insgesamt fünf Arbeitseinsätze im All absolvieren. Nach Angaben der NASA war es eine der schwierigsten Missionen in der Shuttle-Geschichte. Landung. Die US-Raumfähre Columbia ist nach ihrer erfolgreichen Hubble-Mission zur Erde zurückgekehrt. Sie setzte sicher im Raumfahrtzentrum Cape Canaveral in Florida auf. Während ihrer elftägigen Mission hatten sieben Astronauten an Bord der Columbia das Hubble-Teleskop repariert. Dazu unternahmen sie mehrere Weltraumspaziergänge. Laut NASA war es die schwierigste Mission seit der Inbetriebnahme von Hubble. Hey, I just want to say thank you to everybody for just an outstanding mission. And I know how much hard work was put in by folks all across the country, and especially the folks here at Kennedy Space Center, to give us just a great vehicle. I'm awestruck uh, when I look back at everything we were able to do, the folks at Goddard who worked so hard on equipment, the people here, the folks at JSC who trained us, our training team, Just an incredible effort by every single person involved with this flight to make it a success. And from all of us who benefited from being able to spend that time in space and work on the Hubble telescope, I want to say thank you to everybody who supported us with your thoughts and your prayers uh, throughout the entire mission. God bless you all and thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. This is our STS-109 post-landing press conference with the astronauts. And we'll open with Commander Scott Alpin making a statement. And then uh, we'll take questions uh, from those of you that uh, would like to ask uh, any of the crew members some questions and uh, any of the other crew that would like to make statements as well. So, uh, Scott. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Everybody, I guess, uh, or good evening. I'm a little confused. Uh, we, I think, would be just about uh, to go to bed if we were back on orbit uh, in a couple of hours. I appreciate uh, you giving us the opportunity to share a little bit with you. It's just really thrilling for me to be able to sit here and talk to you again after uh, such a successful mission. We're all just thrilled to be here. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't start out by saying thank yous to everybody who worked so hard to make this mission success and give us the tools that we needed to uh, do the job on Hubble. And it started out with the folks who worked on Columbia and Palmdale here at Kennedy Space Center, the people at Goddard who developed uh, the new equipment and the tools, procedures for us to use in space, the folks at Johnson Space Center who trained us, made sure we were prepared both for uh, the EVAs that took place as well as uh, the orbiter malfunctions that might happen. And for a mission that uh, started with a, an emergency like we had, it was very gratifying to be able to stay up on orbit and know that the folks back home were working very hard to figure out exactly what the problem was, understand our capability, and make a decision that ended up allowing us to have a safe and successful uh, end of the mission. So that's, that's my first thing I wanted to say is just share a thank you for all those folks who made this mission possible to be a success. We certainly could not have done it without us, it, it, without them. It is a team effort. And uh, with that, basically, I want to give you an opportunity to ask us some questions about the mission rather than uh, sitting up here and telling you my perspective on things. We've been uh, together with each other for the last uh, 
uh, well, last year of training and then in some fairly tight quarters along Columbia for the last few days, so we're anxious to have some interaction with uh, other people besides each other. <laughs> Uh, so uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over back to you for uh, questions. All right. Uh, Marcia? Well, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. I'll s start with John. How hard is it going to be to wait until late April, early May to get those views of the first pictures from the new cameras? Uh, it's going to be very hard. I know my crewmates will be uh, anxiously awaiting those first images, especially from the ACS. Uh, I'll, I think. I speak for the whole crew, and we're also very interested in NICMAS. Uh, and I can tell you that I'll probably be bothering the folks at the Telescope Institute weekly to get status reports and uh, sneak previews. And I know they're going to be very tight with that, but uh, we're very anxious, very excited. Um, and, and a question for the pilot. Um, your best motorcycle ride that you ever had in your life, how does it compare to what you've just been through? Well, it's uh, apples and oranges comparison. but. Uh, uh, what I've just been through is it was anything but a vacation. Uh, we, we worked hard up there. We had a task, and, and we had a very narrow focus, and we went after it hard. Um, we did as much as we were able to. We, we took some time to enjoy and, and to appreciate, appreciate where we were. But uh, um, it, was, it was pretty hard work up there. And, um, but I'm, I'm here to say I've always been a fan of great vistas when I'm on my motorcycle rides, and I've never seen vistas like we had from 350 statute miles up. Phil? Phil, John Earth News uh, for Nancy. Uh, after your previous three flights with the old instrumentation, what's it like being an MS-2 for landing and launch with the glass cockpit? Uh, how much better did that make your life? It actually makes my life a lot easier. Uh, we have the capability to pull up a lot more displays, and they're graphically oriented instead of the old, you know, kind of steam gauges. And uh, and uh, it's wonderful to fly in the uh, upgraded glass cockpit. And uh, all four of you spacewalkers are now in the, the top 25 uh, U.S. shuttle spacewalkers. Even Mike with only two. And but the questions for for Rick. Um, tell me about the most exciting things uh, on the mission that you. you um, what are the highlights from your, from your memories from your spacewalks? Um, everything. <laughs> every, every bit of the time I was out there. But uh, obviously the first time you go out the door, um, you know, your heart's racing and you've never done it before. And, you know, you look to Jim and John who have been out there before and asked them questions about, you know, hey, how do you do this? How does this feel? What do you do if this happens? And uh, what it all comes down to is you just go out the door and then, you're, wow, you're there and you just do it. Um, but uh, without the training, and uh, the time spent with uh, my crewmates and uh, the other people involved uh, with Hubble over the last almost two years now, um, I couldn't have done that. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a culmination of a dream for me to be able to go out and do that, but uh, I rode on the shoulders of thousands of people involved in the project. Dan? Uh, Dan Billow from WESH TV. <clears throat> the, uh, the imagery, the television pictures, that we saw of your EVAs and the rest of your flight were probably the, the most vivid and memorable images <clears throat> of any shuttle flight ever. And I think I can say that with some uh, authority. I looked at them all. Um, and, you know, that's often treated as, as trivia and as something that's not very important. Um, but I think that someone on this crew or maybe everyone on the crew thinks that it is important. And I just want to ask you, you know, for, for anyone who wants to answer that, what, what is important about that? And why did we see such good pictures? You want to start, Digger? Well, I, I, on paper, I was the, the guy who had the, the moniker, the photo TV guy. But uh, uh, Commander Altman set the tone early on. Um, he had a reputation of being very good with that type of thing. And, and uh, he let us know what was expected and that it, it was important. Not only it is, not only from a just an aesthetic point of view because the, these visuals are so appealing, but as a way to bring our adventure and what we're doing to the public, that indeed supports us. And uh, Scooter was, it was a high priority his on this mission, and, and since he's the boss, I just uh, decided it would be a priority for me too. Well, I, I just, I want to say Digger did a phenomenal job. As a rookie doing it the first time, he was all over the photo TV requirements. We talked about that. Uh, pre-flight, you know, how much we needed uh, to get down to the ground for data analysis to make sure that we were doing all the right things. 
But as well, you know, space flight is just an incredible adventure and journey. And I really wanted to try and share as much of that and what we were doing with uh, the folks on the ground as we could. And he did a fantastic job making that happen. Brad? Uh, Brad Liston from Reuters. Did anyone get a chance to, when you were getting up this morning, to look out the window and see if you could see those uh, uh, twin light beams from New York City, the memorial that was, was turned on there? Was that visible? Uh, Jim, you want to handle that? Uh, I was on the flight deck during that pass, and the flight crew was actually quite busy, of course, preparing for the burn and, and coming home. And I, I looked up the East Coast uh, and saw, uh, did not see those light beams. Uh, we can see pretty far up, but those were not evident this morning. We were just a, a little too long for the nation. Uh, we did get everybody up on the flight deck uh, for one last look at the Earth from over 300 miles up right before the burn, and that was uh, it was a great moment for us to kind of share the, as the mission came to a culmination. And, and one for, um, for John and Rick. Was there any difference in working on Hubble when it was turned off than when it was turned on? I mean, is it any little flashes or beeps or anything like that that uh, were absent, or is it pretty much the same? I think it's pretty much the same. There was a time uh, on the previous mission where there was some RF interference from the Hubble. The Hubble uh, electronics was running, and I actually picked that up in my radio. Uh, we have new radios, and it's, it's basically immune to that, so we really couldn't tell the difference. The, the main thing is that uh, Rick and I both had uh, responsibilities for thermal covers, uh, and we knew the Hubble was off, and we knew that a clock was ticking, that we had to perform the, the work in a relatively expedient fashion, or the telescope would have gotten too cold. And that's just something we all trained to and was, you know, we prepared for. But as far as, you know, any beeps, clicks, lights, or anything else, uh, no difference. Todd? Uh, Todd Halverson of Space.com with one for Scooter and then a, a follow for John. For Scooter, Jay Barbrea of NBC News asked me to ask you to talk about your role in the uh, movie Top Gun with Tom Cruise and uh, what exactly you did in that movie. How did you participate? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a question I wasn't expecting uh, post-flight here, but uh, uh, interesting, uh, Tom Cruise visited JSCs being the narrator for an upcoming uh, NASA IMAX film, and we had a chance to uh, get together while we were doing a Hubble sim and reminisce about the, the days flying uh, in the movie Top Gun. There were four F-14 pilots and four F-14 Rios who flew all the F-14 scenes in the movie, and I was fortunate enough to be one of those. Uh, additionally, flew some of the actors in my back seat from time to time who uh, actually we spent about a week flying the actors with movie cameras in the airplane until the director decided none of the footage was usable in the film because the actors all looked kind of green. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get royalties for that? Uh, the Navy got $7,600 an hour for the rental of the airplanes, and they paid $23 a day for the rental of the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it, no residuals. Pretty, pretty cheap. And, and for, for John Grunsfeld, um, I am wondering, if it was up to you, what would you uh, select as the uh, first target for the advanced camera for surveys, and why? That's a tough question. And we talked about earlier as a crew, you know, what, what do we think the first picture might be? And the balance is, you want to take a picture of something you know, perhaps, so that you can compare it to previous views. Um, I think I would go for broke, and I'd try for another deep field in a different region. Uh, and I'd probably try one where, instead of the previous deep field uh, that was done a number of years ago, about, I think, six years ago now, instead of finding an area that we think is devoid of galaxies and matter, I would try one that we know is rich and see how much further we can see, how much more is there than we already know. Uh, and do that as a test field, because that would then combine a little bit about what we know and hopefully a lot about what we don't know. Phil? Phil Robertson, WFTV here in Orlando. Let me uh, join Dan in thanking you also for the great pictures. And if you could pass that along to other crews, uh, <laughs> we would greatly appreciate that. It certainly helps our medium especially. Right, yes, and ask him to fly us again, and we'll be happy to continue <laughs> to bribe the down. We'll like certainly that. do that. We'll certainly do that. Uh, the mission being so complex, and I certainly have to tell you, 
uh, anything about how hard it was. Are you surprised, even in the slightest, with all those spacewalks and just all the danger involved that everything went so smoothly? Well, if you'd asked us uh, pre-flight, you know, to give you an honest assessment of what our chances were of having everything work as successfully as it had, I would have said that uh, I am hopeful, uh, cautiously optimistic, but at the same time I wouldn't have been surprised if we'd run into more snags. There's always something that you think you may not foresee that, that gets in your way when you're actually up there. We had a few of those snags. We ran into a few small problems, but due to the, the teamwork, I think, and the training that we'd received and the real-time analysis and interface with the ground, uh, we were able to overcome all those things from the spacesuit malfunction, small problems on Hubble, to the Freon cooling loop. Looking back, it is amazing to me that everything went so well. And uh, I think one thing I want to make sure we don't do is this mission was very challenging and just because it went almost picture perfect doesn't mean that it wasn't an incredibly challenging mission that we were very uh, fortunate to have done all our homework to make sure that uh, everything could work out the way it did. And it's that level of attention to detail and extreme uh, work ethic and work effort that is going to end up producing results like that. Okay, we can, okay, Phil, you've got a follow up? Well, just one, uh, you actually did some work that uh, wasn't necessarily planned. Do you feel like you've kind of raised the bar there uh, on future missions and things that uh, you can do in spacewalks that maybe before NASA thought wasn't possible? Well, I think one of the traditions of the Hubble program has, and it's a byproduct of the complexity of the Hubble Space Telescope, is that on each mi subsequent mission, we generally try harder things. And that was true on the last mission, it's true on this mission. Uh, as a result, the uh, spin-off, if you will, is that we learn a lot. We learn a lot about tools, and we get new to tools in the inventory, and we learn about techniques. And those techniques are ones that we can apply to the space station program. And so in some ways, I think by doing difficult spacewalks on Hubble, as an example, we may make it easier, actually, for spacewalkers on the space station to get their jobs done and on future Hubble missions. Uh, five EVAs was quite a lot of work. Um, you know, if you were to ask, could we do more? Well, of course we could do more. And I think that's a discussion that's going to be going on quite actively over the next few weeks as we debrief as to what the right number of missions is on an orbiter like Columbia with four spacesuits and with the kind of work we were doing. Uh, I think, you know, going back to the, the question you asked Scooter, uh, there were probably 100 places on our five EVAs where things could have uh, not gone as well, but it was the teamwork with the crew members inside, working with the crew members outside, that allowed us to, to keep the errors and, and problems manageable, uh, that allowed us to be so successful. I think if you'd asked us pre-flight, if you'd asked me pre-flight, you know, what, what do I think about our probability of success on all the tasks, I would have said, said very high. And if you'd asked me what was the probability that we'd have one very long EVA, I probably would have said that would be high as well. And so I think it was really the teamwork that allowed us to, to do all of our spacewalks, the grapple, the deploy, uh, all of our activities in a very manageable fashion. Okay, we've got time for one or two follow-ups. Marcia? Uh, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Commander Altman. Um, we've all heard how strenuous and, and grueling it, it was for you up until, you know, up until the day of the release. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a sense of that? Like, how little sleep were you getting? Were you, were you eating dinner, like, you know, at midnight, uh, um, our time. <laughs> uh, I, uh, just, just how grueling was the pace up there for the first week? Well, I can tell you uh, my last flight was STS-106 to the station, and I thought we worked an amazing amount then. And then I got on this flight, and I've never worked harder in space in my life. And I think the whole crew would agree that this was a very busy and hardworking mission. It took us uh, roughly four and a half hours to get out the door in the morning of work from when you woke up, to when you went out the door, just trying as hard as we could to get out as early as possible. And as it was, we typically just went out when we planned to by working hard to try and get out early. Then seven to seven and a half, uh, we, never, we didn't have any eight hour EVAs, but I, we were looking close to that. And about five hours at the end to do all the tool reconfig, change out the suits, 
I mean, it was basically like, like having 11 people on Columbia with four suits dancing around in the mid-deck at times. It was very uh, busy. You add all those numbers up, and you're not left with a lot of time for sleeping and eating. Uh, so it was a, a lot of eating on the run, grabbing something, putting it in, and then jumping in your bag because you knew you needed to get as much rest as you could. Okay, Phil, we'll take a question from you, and that will wrap us up. Okay, Phil Chenar, thanks for John. Um, you can uh, walk uh, with your head held high into WAS meetings now uh, since you didn't wreck Hubble. Uh, but for the general public, uh, what do you think makes Hubble so interesting and so much more appealing than uh, every other science uh, craft that NASA's flying right now? I think there's a couple of reasons, one of which is uh, not so much Hubble, but the universe is just a really very beautiful place. And Hubble helps to elucidate that. It, the images it produces are su often surprising, unusual, and, and very beautiful but also the implications of the images. I think people really, when they see a picture that has 2,000 galaxies in it and they know that those galaxies are like our own, uh, it stirs the imagination. On the other side, Hubble came out as you know, kind of an underdog. You know, it was almost written off by the general public prior to the first servicing mission. And on the first servicing mission, we had real people. We had human beings going up and turning that story around completely uh, to the point that Hubble is the most productive uh, scientific machine, but also one of the most popular science instruments, maybe the most popular science instruments in the world, uh, and that the world has ever seen. And with each subsequent mission, there's some aspect that kind of uh, shows uh, the public that you know people going up and, and working hard can make something uh, much better. And it's not just an American prize, uh, it's an international prize. And I think that's appealing to the public, that people can go up in a spaceship with a bunch of tools and, and make something better that at one point was written off. All right, well, thank you to the STS-109 crew, and that will conclude our coverage of STS-109 on NASA television. Thank you. You know, uh, we were assigned about a year before flight, but before you knew it, uh, it seemed like we were sitting in the uh, white room putting our suits on. Here we all are on launch day about four hours prior. This is uh, Nancy Curry, our MS-2. It was her fourth flight. Rick ready to go, and Jim, and Mike. Uh, he's a New Yorker, you can tell. <laughs> then on walkout, it's kind of like coming downstairs on Christmas morning. It's just an unbelievable thrill as you get out there. Uh, of course, the vehicle's parked in the vertical, so it's not like jumping into your car. It's a little bit of a haul to get yourself into the seat. And some of us are a little bit bigger and have a little bit more trouble. <laughs> you can see Mike uh, getting himself in there uh, while the suit tech helps him. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, main engine start, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia to broaden our view of the universe through the Hubble Space Telescope. Columbia, full program. Roger roll, Columbia. Uh, some things are better left unspoken. Uh, eight and a half minutes later, we were in orbit. Then uh, it's time to get the orbiter ready, unpack everything that was packed away for the launch, and get prepared for flight day three, which was the rendezvous with the Hubble Space Telescope. We rendezvoused up from below, uh, came up till it was just hanging there, perched above the payload bay. This is a shot of the uh, flight deck during the rendezvous. You can see that uh, we're working there in Columbia. Rick Linehan was our handheld laser operator. That's what gave us our ranges to the telescope when we first looked out to see it. It really was uh, a beautiful sight to see that uh, hanging up there. Of course, flying the rendezvous is uh, hand-flown. 
uh, Tim Hagen, our instructor who taught us everything we knew, was there with us in spirit as we uh, pulled up to the telescope. You can see it through the optical sight there. Then Nancy used the robotic arm to reach out and uh, snare the Hubble Space Telescope. That's her working on the aft flight deck controlling that arm. This is the view that she had as she was uh, pulling up and overflying the snares. And you can bet that uh, once we had that thing on board, there was a lot of happy campers, a big sense of relief as we had those handshakes. Well, of course, once we had the Hubble, our day wasn't over. We had an ambitious uh, evening of rolling up the solar arrays. On the first servicing mission, STS-61, they had to jettison one array, so we were very anxious uh, to see. It was kind of a pivotal moment as we rotate the telescope here. One solar array stowed. Uh, still wondering what was going to happen with the second one, and we rolled up the second one. And we were very, very fortunate that both solar arrays uh, rolled up. That set the stage for the next day, the first of five spacewalks, extravehicular activities. And we've combined uh, the two solar array days because over the first three days, we replaced nearly the entire power system of Hubble. And we started that by stowing the old solar arrays, the Solar Array 2s. These are arrays built by the European Space Agency, one of the partners on the Hubble Space Telescope and also an integral partner in the International Space Station. This is a view from uh, one of the helmet cams. That was a very useful tool throughout the mission. And so you'll have the opportunity today to see some of the views that we had inside of the spacesuit. After removing those solar arrays from the telescope, uh, we brought them back down into the payload bay and stowed them on one of the carriers that we brought up with us in the payload bay. And uh, using the power tool, which you see there on the lower right, we were able to lock those down into the payload bay for return to planet Earth. Of course, the spacecraft choreographer, the IV crew member, inside crew member, is integral to the, all of the operations and uh, runs the show for each EVA. After we uh, got the uh, old solar arrays uh, on our carrier to take home, it was time to get the new solar arrays out. And uh, here's a view of how what we did. We got the solar arrays out of the carrier, and then we had to rotate them on the arm. Uh, Scooter alluded to that earlier. Uh, we weren't tethered to the solar array at this point. Uh, we didn't want to lose it, so we went really slow. And here's a view of the helmet camera. This is what we were looking at uh, as we rotated it, nice and slow, uh, making sure we wouldn't uh, put any unnecessary input into it uh, and just being real careful. After we uh, finished with the rotation and got the mast of the new solar array pointed toward the telescope, it was time to uh, insert it into the telescope. There you can see the clamp and the mass of the, of the, uh, mass of the solar array going into the clamp on the telescope and uh, clamping it down. And there are a lot of watchful eyes on us while we were doing this. The uh, new solar arrays, unlike the old ones, uh, folded like a book. The old ones just sort of kind of reeled in. The uh, new ones unfolded like a book, and that's the last few degrees of the, uh, of the deploy of the new solar array. And here's what Hubble looks like now with its new solar arrays. Digger was inside uh, busily uh, taping everything. He was kind of like our producer director, Steven Spielberg in space, <laughs> making sure everything got recorded and downlinked. Uh, after we uh, finished our solar array uh, on the second day of EVAs, Jim and I uh, changed out a reaction wheel assembly. This is the exchange of the old one for the new. Jim's got the old one, putting that away to take home. And here's the new one going into the telescope. We had some extra time on EVA2. And uh, at the end of the EVA, here's Jim carrying a new outer blanket layer that was put onto the telescope. And here's a view from, uh, from a helmet camera at the end of that EVA. And you get an idea of uh, what it looks like to us up there. And another helmet camera view. With the uh, stage set for the power system uh, on EVA3, we went out for what we thought was going to be the start of EVA3 and the power control unit change. Unfortunately, due to glitch in a power supply, the uh, water supply in one of the suits started leaking. And so we had about a two-hour delay while we resized the suits. They were designed to do that on orbit. And it's one of the great features that we were s had onboard spares. So I went out with uh, Jim's backpack, and we set out to turn off the telescope the first time in 12 years. That was a scene of the battery being disconnected. This is the power control unit. Uh, I think all of those connectors on the left side there kind of speak for themselves, that it was a day to uh, manage frustration and concentrate on one connector at a time. Rick disconnected all the uh, connections on the left. We swapped the old box for the new. This is a photograph or a movie of going in with the new, out with the old, in with the new. 
and then the reverse, one by one, just one connector after another, uh, putting all those left side connectors back on. We had a special tool to help us do that, and 36 connectors later, the PCU was complete. Uh, one final picture of the telescope on EVA3, and we were ready to set the stage for the next day. Uh, Mike Massimino and I were going to go outside and put in the advanced camera for surveys. This is what uh, Sean was referring to, Mr. Keefe was referring to about the, uh, the new capability for the Hubble, and we're really looking forward to the first pictures that are going to come out. There's an old faint object camera that was no longer being used. First, uh, we took that out of the telescope and uh, temporarily stowed that on the side while the people in indoors were keeping track and making sure we were doing the right things. The choreography for this part was such that Mike was going to then help me pull the old one out and then we were going to bring it up and carefully insert it. It had a fairly small capture envelope and here you see it coming up. But the Goddard Space Flight Center has done remarkable work in, in making some of these tasks almost EVA friendly. There's the big box going in now and we were able to get it uh, hooked up and there's Mike hooking up the connectors and we found out fairly shortly that uh, it was alive and working. We then uh, put the old faint object camera away and got ready to do the cooling system. Okay, a picture of uh, Jim and Mike installing the cache, which is a large cable electronic connection that will reach across from inside the telescope to connect uh, both sides. And uh, in the back of the payload bay, Jim is down there now, about to take out a module called the ESM, which is one of the upgrade units uh, that's going to control the electronics uh, and routing for the different scientific instruments we're putting in. Scott's uh, on the arm today, flying them around. Uh, you can see him on the hand controllers as Jim passes the ESM up to Mike, who was on the end of the robot arm, stretched almost all the way out to the back end of the payload bay. Now Jim, uh, after he hands off, uh, will be free-floating, making his way back up to the front of the telescope while Mike flies up. You can see the ESM, a uh, picture of his helmet camera right there, close up. They've got that installed, and they're beginning to replace the connectors on the ESM. They're hand connectors that go on and, uh, and, and latch on with your hand. Nice picture of Mike here as he free floats and comes across. You can see the helmet lights and the cameras, as well as Jim giving a thumbs up through the aft windows. Uh, flight crew is taking these pictures. And a really nice picture of Jim when they're complete. He's on his back there waving goodbye to the Earth uh, through the helmet cameras. Really pretty picture. Now, we had to be electricians and plumbers uh, on EVA-5. Uh, we were putting a new cooling system, an upgrade unit, uh, to replace one that had failed on one of the scientific instruments, an infrared camera. And uh, you can see there's the robot arm there. Uh, we're getting the NCC, that large black box, similar to the ESM. John closed the uh, coverage of the thermal insulation. And uh, John here is on the end of the arm bringing a large radiator around, which will actually go on the outside of Hubble. So we're changing the way Hubble looks and that we're hanging this huge radiator on the back. And you'll see in a second, we've got a large conduit full of uh, plumbing and uh, electrical cables that will actually route under Hubble and bring it back up inside through the bottom. And uh, that large sock there is what's being pushed up by me. You can see me down there on the bottom. We had just installed the conduit. John's pulling it through. And eventually, we'll hook that up up top, peel it open, and take these cables and evaporator lines out and hook them up to that black box you just saw us take out a while ago called the NCC. And uh, right now we're getting, uh, actually the NCC seems to be running well and we're getting it to cool down. It's going to take weeks. You can see us uh, as we uh, finish up and we're closing the doors. And a picture of us uh, with the uh, tool handles uh, ready to go back into the airlock. And a really nice picture saying goodbye, uh, end of the day, and beautiful shot of the earth in the background. After the uh, EVAs were complete, it was time to uh, say goodbye to the telescope. It's Nancy and I at the robotics uh, workstation going in for the uh, grapple of the HST while it was still on the uh, support structure. And that's a picture of the end effector on top of the grapple fixture. After we uh, latched onto the Hubble, we uh, lifted it up off of the, uh, the, s the uh, support structure and got it ready to uh, be deployed. This next scene, you'll see the arm actually coming off of the telescope, followed by Scooter flying us away. You know, it's amazing to look out and see this massive object in the payload bay as it floats right across our window. I think everyone on the flight deck ducked as it went by. 
because then we had the uh, photo frenzy as everybody got up there to take photos of this amazing event as we just watched it uh, pirouette in space out in front of us as we uh, said goodbye. Just, uh, w I think uh, the telescope looked like it was in great shape there. Rick is using the handheld laser again to take a mark as we drift away. You can see he got 435 feet uh, out. And we had our final uh, goodbye looks as we uh, sped away from the Hubble and, and left it behind. It's just a tremendous jewel uh, for NASA and the world. Let me tell you, after nine hard days, we were looking forward to a day off like you look forward to a two-week vacation. And uh, we're getting things, uh, we're getting ready for the morning there. There's our personal kit. If it's not tied down or Velcroed, you're probably going to lose it on orbit. Here's a uh, cycle ergometer machine that uh, we traded out twice a day to uh, allow folks enough room to work out. Uh, there's Mike getting his workout. Let me tell you, exercise felt great up there. It, uh, was, it was a real necessity. Lunchtime on the mid-deck. Not much extra space, but uh, it's a good thing we all got along with each other. Mike did a good job that day, so here's his reward. Uh, the Earth really zings by. Uh, here's a look straight down at the coast of South America going into the Andes. Uh, you can see how fast we're moving, even though we're 350 miles up. Uh, Scooter's taking some uh, Earth observation shots with a little bit of spare time on that day off. We got some wonderful views. You can see, you can really see the curvature of the Earth up there, uh, up from 350 miles. And we also got some nice uh, sunrises up there. Happens every hour and a half. We did a burn the next day to get ready for entry. You can see Nancy didn't have her seat belts on. Uh, she's hanging on for dear life, and then uh, the day after that, it was time to come home. We put on our suits and uh, did our deorbit burn and began to fall back into Earth's atmosphere. Things really started to heat up and uh, started flashing outside. Uh, you're going to see in this next shot that Rick is looking at the vertical tail in his mirror. He asked me to look back there and see how it was glowing white hot, and I said, uh, no thanks, buddy. <laughs> Some things you just don't want to see. Finally, as we're uh, coming into the Cape, we got our first good look uh, at the ground. It was just a beautiful night uh, as we're falling. This is an infrared shot. You can see uh, the shuttle, the belly of the shuttle heated up from the entry. It's glowing white hot. As we rolled around uh, and lined up with the runway, called down to the ground, field inside on a beautiful night. 300 feet, uh, Digger puts down the landing gear. You can see that they appear dark and cold from being stowed up in the belly. And then this is the shot we had as we came in for landing that night uh, as the runway pulls up in front of us. Just pull the nose up, try and uh, touch down as gracefully as you can with a 225,000 uh, glider brick. <laughs> you can see uh, the landing gear as we touch down here are going to spin up and heat up, become uh, sort of white hot right after touchdown. Drag chute comes out. The landing was so much fun, we wanted to do it again. So. <laughs> it's really amazing to me to think that, uh, you know, an hour earlier, we were going five miles every second. Now, uh, here we are back at our home uh, at Kennedy where we started, uh, stopped at the end of the runway where the convoy comes out to greet us. Everybody, uh, we stop on centerline there. Uh, we all jump out and have a chance to shake hands and say hello. Administrator came to greet us, and we uh, really enjoyed that. Just uh, super to get a chance to look out at the vehicle that took you to space and brought you back. Everybody was uh, really pumped up to be home. And just uh, one chance to say hello and salute all the folks uh, that worked so hard to make this mission a success. Columbia Houston on glide slope on center line. Houston, Columbia, field inside on a beautiful night. Columbia, wheel stop KSC. Columbia, Houston, we copy wheel stop. 
Welcome back, and we'd uh, like to congratulate you all on a very successful mission servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. We have no post-landing delta. March 2002, 360 miles above the Earth. Just enjoy it, Rick. Wow. This, where, this, where are we going over now, guys? That's all America. Man, incredible. Columbia travels to the Hubble Space Telescope. During an unprecedented five spacewalks, astronauts give Hubble new solar arrays and a new power system, a powerful new camera, and refurbish its infrared eyes, leaving behind a Hubble destined for spectacular new discoveries. And yet today, uh, we really don't have any other alternative but to try again to describe how much more we accomplished on this flight than one could have believed possible uh, a year ago or so. Yes, you're right. We are exhausted, but we are also exhilarated. Let's go for orbiter access arm retract. Columbia OTC, good luck on your mission, allowing us to better glimpse our future by enhancing Hubble's view of the past. STS-109 is the third Hubble servicing mission, charged with the challenging task of upgrading the telescope and deploying new science instruments to allow Hubble to continue its extraordinary record of astronomical achievements. During the five planned EVAs, the crew would give Hubble new solar arrays, a new power control unit, install the advanced camera for surveys, and refurbish the NICMOS infrared system using an experimental cooler. The manifest will push the very limits of what man can do in space. The crew chosen to meet the challenge is a team of seasoned veterans leading a couple of first-time space travelers. The mission's commanded by Scott Altman, also known as Scooter, a Navy commander and former test pilot, he's been in space twice before, but STS-109 is his first command. One is as the mission commander, looking at what's going on and just kind of trying to evaluate, making sure that we're doing the right thing, and just keeping the big picture, trying to help out uh, as much as possible. I'm also backing Nancy up with uh, the arm duties, using the robotic arm. Up front with Scooter is Digger, or pilot Dwayne Carey. An Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, Digger was selected as an astronaut in 1996 and is making his first space flight. As pilot, he's responsible for a number of systems during ascent and descent and will assist piloting the craft during a rendezvous. There comes a point when Scooter, when we get close enough to actually see the telescope as we get closer to it, there comes a point when Scooter is going to uh, go to the aft flight deck so he can look out the overhead window and uh, uh, fly us up toward Hubble. At that point, I'm going to jump in his chair and uh, I have a few more small burns to do to, get, to make little small corrections and get us uh, going up toward the telescope. D minus four minutes. John Grunsfeld is the payload commander for STS-109 and is responsible for the payload operations and the five spacewalks. He'll be making three trips outside himself. The main uh, part of my job as payload commander on STS-109 occurs here on the ground. Uh, my responsibilities are to make sure that, that Jim Newman, Rick Linehan, and Mike Massimino and myself, uh, that we're trained to do the EVA tasks, that the tools that we have that we're taking up with us are the right tools and that they work, and that all of the equipment in the payload bay uh, is arranged in such a way that uh, we can do our job. Uh, I'm also prime for knowing all the Hubble systems, so once we've got Hubble and we've got it docked, uh, that I can work with the rest of the crew to make sure we keep Hubble happy while, <laughs> while Hubble's in the payload bay. Grunsfeld has flown three times before, and Hubble is an old friend. In December 1999, he worked outside with the telescope during the second servicing mission. Thank you very much. In charge of operating the remote manipulator system, or the robot arm, is Nancy Curry, an Army Lieutenant Colonel and Master Army Aviator. 
She has over 4,000 hours in rotary and fixed-wing aircraft and was a helicopter instructor pilot. She's been in space before, working the robot arm during the first International Space Station assembly mission. In fact, this flight will mark her fourth trip into space. So for the first time since it was launched 11 years ago, we're going to power Hubble completely down. Um, there's some inherent risk just in doing that, um, because what if it doesn't power back up? But, you know, of course, we have looked at that in many, many different ways and many different scenarios, and we feel certain that, uh, that this, will, uh, this procedure will be very effective. And once the new power control unit is in place, of course, then it will transform the power from these new solar arrays and the batteries to the spacecraft. Richard Lenahan is a doctor of veterinary medicine, serving with the Army Veterinarian Corps. He'll team with John Grunsfeld for three spacewalks. An astronaut since 1992, Lenahan has been in space twice before, but this will mark his first chance to step outside. Checking the flight controls now on Columbia. And that will be followed by the steering check of the main engines. Gaseous oxygen vent hood now being retracted. James Newman's been in space three times and is a veteran of four spacewalks, including spacewalks during the first space station assembly flight. He's been an astronaut since 1990. My primary responsibility is as a member of the, uh, the team of spacewalkers. Um, Mike Massimino and I will be going out on the second and fourth spacewalks. And as the experienced spacewalker of uh, Mike and I, of our little section, then my job is to make sure that our spacewalks are well choreographed, that Mike has the opportunity to learn what he can from those of us who have been outside before. And then when we go out together, we'll combine our skills to make a strong team in order to get our jobs done. Teaming up with James Newman will be Michael Massimino, making his first flight into space. He's scheduled for two spacewalks on STS-109. Michael also has backup robotic arm responsibilities. Nancy Curry is our primary uh, robot arm uh, operator, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be her backup. So I work with her to do that. So when uh, Nancy will get the arm in position, I'll be uh, getting the right uh, displays up for her, checking the computer displays, getting information that both of us need to make sure everything's going well. Uh, then I'll be helping her out when she goes and grapples the uh, the telescope and, and uh, secures it to the uh, to the robot arm. I got your block. Hey, the catch is unlocked. These seven team members, trained and poised and supported by thousands on the ground, are ready to embark on the adventure of rising from the earth. T minus one minute. Solid rocket booster field joint heaters now being turned off. It's uh, almost indescribable. You're sitting there on the pad waiting for the engines to light off. You feel like you're back in the simulator. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. Until all of a sudden uh, the engines light up, the whole vehicle starts shaking, and there's no doubt in your mind you're no longer in a simulator. Eight, four, three, two, one. This is the real thing. And then the solid rocket boosters light off, and you get a huge kick in the pants as uh, you roar off the pad. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia to broaden our view of the universe through the Hubble Space Telescope. Houston now controlling the flight of Columbia, the Pioneer shuttle headed for the Hubble Space Telescope. Roger roll, Columbia. Columbia into the roll, placing the shuttle in a heads down wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. The 25 seconds into the flight, Columbia's three liquid fuel main engines now throttling back in a three step fashion to 72% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Already two miles in altitude, one and a half miles downrange, leaving an incandescent trail behind it. Columbia headed for Hubble, Hubble almost directly over the Cape at this moment. Three engines now uh, throttling down, uh, soon to throttle back up to 104% of rated performance. The main engines, along with the three fuel cells and three hydraulic power units, all functioning normally. Standing by. You are go at throttle up. Columbia copy, go at throttle up. That throttle up call from Capcom Mark Polanski acknowledged by Commander Scott Altman aboard Columbia. Altman joined on the flight deck by pilot Dwayne Carey, flight engineer Nancy Curry, and mission specialist John Grunsfeld. 
Rick Lenahan, Jim Newman, and Mike Massimino seated down on the mid-deck. Columbia tracking right down the pike, 15 miles in altitude, 11 and a half miles downrange, heading due east from the Kennedy Space Center for an altitude of 350 statute miles in pursuit of Hubble. One minute, 45 seconds into the flight, about 15 seconds prior to solid rocket booster separation. Standing by for SRB separation. Hubble is the most productive and has uh, uh, space mission, science mission, and has had the highest impact of all NASA science missions in the history of the agency. Without the servicing that, that we've done and the refurbishment and upgrades of the technology on Hubble that we've done, this would not continue to be the case, but it does continue to be the case year by year. Over the last 12 years, over 100,000 incredible images have been captured through the eyes of the Hubble Space Telescope. Mysteries have been solved and others have been opened. Mysteries revealed by Hubble that weren't even considered before the telescope was put into operation. These new questions have created an even bigger hunger for understanding our universe. The current demand for, for the use of Hubble by astronomers all around the world uh, exceeds our ability to satisfy that demand by a factor of eight for every uh, orbit that we're able to assign to an astronomer to observe with Hubble, eight orbits are proposed by astronomers and, and those are usually very high quality proposals and it's just very painful to have to have to reject some because there's just not enough observing time on the telescope to accommodate everyone who would like to use it. And, and this factor of eight is a record, that's the highest it's ever been for Hubble and I attribute that to the uh, to the eager anticipation the community has for using the advanced camera for surveys, which is going to be this tremendously powerful new tool that has been successfully inserted on Hubble during this mission. And we can just hardly wait to get our hands on it. The astronomical community can hardly wait to get its collective hands on it. It's a far better machine than when it was first launched. I mean, it's the, the capabilities uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the science that it can produce. Uh, we've got a whole new uh, generation of, of technology. From its rocky start with a flawed mirror to an observational powerhouse today, Hubble has been serviced and upgraded to keep pace with advances in technology. The differences in these images demonstrate the profound change between the Wide Field Planetary Camera 1 and the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2. The advanced camera for surveys offers a similar advance in resolving power. In, in general terms, the advanced camera for survey, surveys uses modern CCD charge couple device technology as the core of its camera. Now, of course, we've always had CCDs, but on the Hubble, because we can't take film pictures on Hubble and get them back to Earth. So we always use electronic devices. But the advanced camera for surveys is just that. It's very advanced using very large CCDs of unprecedented quality and sensitivity. And that's the heart of it. It's like a camcorder. All of our camcorders that we buy nowadays have these little CCDs in it. Well, Hubble's going to have a huge one and a very, very sensitive one. And it's going to be able to take pictures and integrate the pictures over long periods of time and therefore be able to, using the optics and using the, the enhancements in the CCD technology, to deliver unprecedented quality and clarity of pictures. Hubble is the most frequently sighted space mission uh, within the scientific literature. It's also the most frequently cited space science mission within the media. It's a national icon. I dare say it's the most widely recognized space science mission that NASA has ever had in the general public. 
I think the main reason for these huge successes is that the Hubble program of, of exploring our universe excites and motivates and brings out the best in all of us. The 12-ton Hubble Observatory is designed for a lifetime of 20 years. One more servicing mission is scheduled before the planned end of Hubble's useful life in 2010. Hubble has revolutionized astronomy since being placed in orbit and especially since the December 1993 repair mission. Hubble's place in orbit, high above the obscuring atmosphere and light pollution of Earth, gives the telescope a supreme observation position from which to resolve deep into space. Hubble has proven to be a remarkably diverse tool for examining planets, stars, galaxies, and quasars. The rate of data output from the observatory will be 20 times greater than the original rate of output back in the early 1990s after Hubble was first launched. And after our next servicing mission, servicing mission four, when we will again upgrade the instrumentation capabilities on Hubble and broaden them uh, uh, to create a, a, a more complementary and consistent set of observing capabilities, after that mission, the data output in terms of gigabytes of data per month produced by the observatory will be 44 times higher than it was at, at the beginning of the mission. We've looked back over the past 12 years and tried to judge what areas of scientific research Hubble has had the greatest impact on. And we've come up with a top 10 list of, of highest impact research areas from Hubble. And if you look at those top 10 research areas, four of them, 40%, were not anticipated at the time Hubble was first launched. And uh, at the time Hubble was launched, we had a little slogan, conscious expectation of the unexpected. And that has certainly proven to be the case, that sort of at the four out of 10 level, we're doing science today we couldn't have dreamed of doing in 1990. The achievements of Hubble have been extraordinary. Hubble took the deepest views ever made of the visible universe, revealing galaxies dating back to within a billion years of the Big Bang. With Hubble's increasing power, we're inching ever closer to seeing back in time as far as we can see. Hubble precisely measured the current expansion rate of the universe, a value sought for nearly 70 years since Edwin Hubble first discovered the universe is expanding uniformly in all directions. Hubble made the definitive observations showing that the universe is destined to expand forever and is even accelerating driven by dark energy, a mysterious repulsive force that is pervasive among the galaxies. Hubble discovered and found evidence for supermassive black holes forming the cores of most galaxies, the clearest evidence yet for the existence of these remarkable objects. The telescope provided the clearest views ever of the diverse and complex processes at work in the birth and the death of stars. With spectacular clarity, Hubble has recorded the unbounded violence and beauty of the death of stars. Hubble showed that the first embryonic steps in planet formation are common around many stars in the form of vast disks of dust and gas. Hubble provided stunningly clear views of the northern lights on Jupiter and Saturn, furnished incredibly clear pictures of Mars, and gave us our first course map of the planet Pluto. In 12 short years, Hubble has opened the very eyes of mankind on the incredible vista of the universe. The view from orbit. Space Shuttle Columbia, fresh from a two-year refit and nearly 21 years after first flight, back in space to refurbish the Hubble Space Telescope, 360 miles above the Earth. Upon reaching orbit, Columbia experienced a malfunction which threatened to end the mission. 
one of the cooling loops, which circulates Freon to remove heat from the orbiter, was not flowing at a proper rate. Mission Control examined the problem and found that the flow had stabilized and the mission could continue. While the rate remained low throughout the flight, the loop stayed stable. The real impact will now be felt by Columbia's next mission, scheduled in July. With Freon loop diagnosis and repair a necessity, Columbia's tight 2002 schedule could slip. With the coolant loop problem stable for the moment, Columbia worked to catch up with Hubble in order to grapple the telescope with the remote manipulator system, or robot arm. Grappling a free flyer um, is probably one of the more difficult things we do with the arm. Houston, we have uh, Hubble on the arm. Copy Scooter, outstanding work, and there's a big sigh of relief we heard from uh, Goddard all the way here. I think it echoed up here as well. With Hubble safely captured and berthed, work could begin on refurbishing the telescope. The first two EVAs would replace the Hubble's solar arrays and their operational hardware. To prepare, the old arrays were retracted. The telescope was positioned to allow the crew to monitor the retraction on each side to spot any abnormality in the process. Columbia, Houston, you should see Stowe on both microswitches. Yes, we do. And we got a winner on both sides. Uh, we're going to replace the solar rays, put in a new power control unit, uh, some new diode boxes that go with the solar rays. And, and those improvements are specifically designed uh, to allow Hubble to have more capability to replace the current solar rays, which were designed to be replaced, that was anticipated, mm -hmm. and to ensure that Hubble has a long and happy lifetime. Can you come out a little forward more? Okay, there you go. Oh, wow. Beautiful view. Uh, obviously, the first time you go out the door, um, you know, your heart's racing and you've never done it before and, you know, we look to Jim and John, who've been out there before and asked them questions about, you know, hey, how do you do this? How does this feel? What do you do if this happens? And uh, what it all comes down to is you just go out the door and then, you're, wow, you're there, and then you just do it. This is incredible. Mike, welcome to the wonderful world of spacewalking. Thank you, John. The key word in a successful EVA is preparation and the right tool for the right job. Working in space requires deliberate action. Each loose part and astronaut must be secured by tethers to prevent them from floating away, and each movement calculated to inflict the proper loads for the work to be accomplished. In microgravity, the fact that every action causes an opposite reaction has serious consequences and each movement and task is meticulously planned. We have uh, some specialized tools for this mission. Uh, as uh, we're doing, I think, about 100 connectors in one day for the PCU changeout, that's the power control unit, uh, we've developed a special connector tool that gives us a lot more holding power on the connectors, better mechanical advantage, uh, so we'll be using that quite extensively. Uh, there are a number of other tools that are specialized, as every Hubble flight has, for different tasks, for the solar array tasks, uh, for the cooling system. So we'll be using those as well. Prepared for its complex work on the telescope, Columbia's payload bay organizes materials in four basic units. Up front is the rigid array carrier. Here's where Hubble's new solar arrays travel, with space for storing the old arrays for the trip back to Earth. Farther aft is the second axial carrier containing the advanced camera for surveys, the power control unit, and the Nikmos cryocooler. Moving farther back is the flight support system, where Hubble will be parked for servicing. This unit securely holds Hubble to Columbia and allows for positioning and rotation of the telescope to a suitable attitude for work. At the rear of the payload bay is the lightweight equipment carrier, containing the Nikmos cryocooler radiator. Okay, you guys ready for the rotate? 
Okay, we're ready for the rotate. Nancy's ready. For the solar array replacement, the SA-2, or old arrays, would be removed and stowed for return. Then the new SA-3 array would be deployed by an astronaut riding the end of the robot arm. With the arm moving the astronaut and array into position, the other team member guided and then secured the new array to the side of Hubble. Each team replaced one of the panels, and by the end of EVA-2, the telescope was sporting brand new enhanced solar arrays, two-thirds the size of the previous assemblies, delivering 20% more power. The look of Hubble was changed forever. Before the flight, EVA number three promised to be the longest and the most risky. For the first time since it was launched, Hubble would be completely powered down. We want to be very particular about the manner in which we do that. Uh, the other thing is that there's a multitude of connectors on this power control unit. It was initially never designed to be changed out, quite frankly, uh, especially via EVA. But it's something that in the development of servicing missions and the development of new tools, um, it's been deemed appropriate, an appropriate task to go ahead and, uh, and change this out. But just before doing so, trouble. John Grunsfeld's spacesuit sprang a leak, and cooling water pooled in his backpack. Uh, the first thing that went through my mind is to immediately let everybody know that we weren't going to be going out in the next few minutes as we thought we were going to, and that we needed to assess the situation so we could get Houston on board with us as part of a team to help us make some good decisions about where to go next. I was really impressed with Jim Newman and that he recognized the uh, fault right away, got everybody together as a team. Uh, they took John out of the suit, got the suit out, uh, cleaned that up, and immediately reconfigured uh, one of the other EMUs, actually Jim's own EMU, and uh, we've uh, got new arms on it to fit John and uh, got him back in the suit, and uh, I was amazed at uh, how little time it took. This time, the task was to replace Hubble's power control unit. When we first opened the door to the PCU, uh, we were a little, uh, I guess we're taking it back because uh, the, the uh, uh, cables at the top of the PCU were out a bit farther than what we were used to training on, and so we wondered if we could uh, get the cables off. As it turns out, uh, due to the extreme uh, low temperatures uh, up here, the cables are very stiff. Uh, so yeah, it was, uh, it was tough. Uh, to get the uh, cables to bend back and get the connectors back. And uh, as you can see in the helmet cam, uh, you, had, you had the same view I did. Uh, I, I, I had uh, a bit of trouble trying to get the cables in and I kind of protected the connectors in my hand. And once I had them, I was able to bring the connectors back and put them in a special board to res uh, restrain them so John could get them to put back later. So we were very happy that uh, everything went as well as it did. We had a good time and uh, I'm just, uh, just thrilled that uh, Hubble was uh, living and breathing again. On each mi subsequent mission, we generally try harder things. And that was true on the last mission, it's true on this mission. Uh, as a result, the uh, spin-off, if you will, is that we learn a lot. We learn a lot about tools, and we get new to tools in the inventory, and we learn about techniques. And those techniques are ones that we can apply to the space station program. Hubble was alive again universe is just a really very beautiful place and Hubble helps to elucidate that. The images it produces are su often surprising, unusual, and, and very beautiful, but also the implications of the images. I think people really, when they see a picture that has 2,000 galaxies in it and they know that those galaxies are like our own, uh, it stirs the imagination. Good to be back. Beautiful day for a spacewalk. Three difficult spacewalks done, two more to follow to improve the first of NASA's great observatories to explore the wonder that surrounds us. Columbia starts a day of spacewalking, the fourth in a row. And on this day, the Hubble Space Telescope will be provided with an all-new scientific instrument, 
The advanced camera for surveys. On the fourth day, Mike and I will go back out and replace an old camera, the faint object camera, with the ACS or advanced camera for surveys. This camera is really the scientific highlight of the mission. It in, uses uh, recent advances in CCD technology to literally improve the telescope tenfold in its uh, ability to see into the universe. With the addition of the ACS, Hubble's scientists will be able to reach far beyond the current capabilities of the telescope and take less time to do so. The ACS can survey a field in the sky twice as large as the original Hubble Deep Field to the same exposure depth three to four times faster. A deep core sample looking far back in time to shortly after stars and galaxies began to form required 10 days with the original Hubble Deep Field. Such an exposure will take just three days with the ACS. During EVA-4, astronauts Newman and Massimino installed the advanced camera for surveys in the location previously occupied by the faint object camera, the last of Hubble's original instruments. The ACS will become Hubble's new workhorse, from searching for planets around other stars to monitoring weather on planets around our own. Maybe just go out a little bit to your left. Yeah, we got a little bit of a roll. Yeah, roll towards the port side. What uh, axis are you using? I'm using an orbiter axis and your body axis. Yeah, I'm using orbiter coordinates. So tell me what you want me to do with it. Yeah, we're going to roll it left. Right. To install the ACS, Newman and Massimino removed the camera from its protective enclosure and gently guided it against rails into the telescope bay. Yeah, but we're, I'm going to stay up here. We're going to bring it half to three quarters in. Okay. Maybe a little more. You're going to, like we did, talk about it. You're going to uh, stabilize it. Okay. And then I'm going to have Nancy bring me down to the middle. Or over a little bit to verify these blocks. After securing the instrument, the advanced camera for surveys was installed. EVA-4 involved another task to prepare for the last spacewalk, the installation of an electronic control unit for the NICMOS cryo cooler. With their work complete, Newman and Massimino said goodbye to their spacewalking tasks on STS-109. I, I knew that it was going to be a great experience and that I was extremely fortunate to be part of this crew with, with these folks and part of the whole Hubble team. But uh, the memories I have from this uh, will last me forever. You know, just thoughts of being uh, being outside with uh, with Jim and uh, working with him and with the guys inside and and being flown around on the arm by Nancy and looking back into the cockpit and seeing Nancy and Scooter and Digger and, and uh, working with us and then uh, looking over the horizon and seeing the Earth and and then also the work we did, uh, you know, concentrating on the different tasks and, and those going well and getting it all done. It was it was just just an awesome experience. Uh, it's something something I'll never forget, and these, I think these memories are going to stay with me for uh, forever. On spacewalking day five, Grunsfeld and Linehan would once again venture out to install a cooler on the near infrared camera and multi-object spectrometer. The NICMOS was installed in February of 1997 and visualizes the universe in infrared wavelengths. And finally on the fifth day, John and Rick will go back outside in order to put a radiator and a cooler on in order to uh, refurbish an infrared detector which uh, has, is now dormant because it no longer has sufficient cooling. In order to see in the infrared, they need a detector which is very, very cool because it's so sensitive to the, uh, the infrared spectrum. EVA-5 would involve Grunsfeld and Linehan performing the installation of plumbing and electronic wiring from the cryo cooler to a large radiator on the outside of Hubble. Neon gas would circulate through the instrument to the radiator where heat would be dumped to space. Installation of the radiator was not a simple task. Locked to handrails on the aft shroud of the telescope, 
The radiator's position brings it close to one of the bay doors. Proper alignment was essential to maintain clearance for the next servicing mission. Uh, the cryo cooler was, uh, was the last EVA that we did and uh, it was uh, fairly physically demanding. A lot of, uh, a lot of intricate work inside uh, and it's funny, uh, the uh, radio was, uh, was difficult to get on because of some, uh, some of the things that happen in space aren't quite like they are in 1G obviously and uh, minor loads that you would uh, be able to react against uh, on the ground are more difficult to work with in space because your body just uh, pushes away from the load. Through a team effort that became a hallmark of the STS-109 spacewalks, the radiator was locked onto Hubble and all the primary tasks of the mission with the exception of a successful redeployment, were now complete. And it was time to wrap up the work and come inside. Uh, up here in Columbia on STS 109, we've just finished five days of spacewalking. We've given Hubble a new power system that will take it off into the next decade of discovery. We've given it new eyes to see deeper into the universe than it's ever been able to see before. And I think you'll see that People at the Space Telescope Science Institute, universities all around the world, amateur astronomers, young and old, will be able to enjoy the beauty and inspiration that these new pictures from Hubble will bring. This is the first of the third time now that I've been out in space. It amazes me that folks in Hamilton that uh, that can build a piece of apparatus or equipment like this that allows humans to come out into the most, the, the harshest environment imaginable and function and work almost as if uh, we didn't have a suit on. After a while, working in the, in the uh, EMU, it almost becomes like a second skin, an exoskeleton. And uh, it's just amazing what you can do here uh, and also the view. Uh, I just still can't believe that I'm here and uh, I've got to spend this time in space with uh, six other just fantastic people. And uh, there's no way we could have accomplished this mission without those, uh, without those people. Uh, just an, an amazing crew and uh, just a wonderful experience. And I guess uh, a little kind of on a lighter note or comic relief here, this is a true story. Uh, my uh, physics professor or my physics teacher in high school, he's listening. Uh, he used to tell me <laughs> the only thing I'd ever be good at is taking up space. So I guess I made it big time. Thanks. Well, XST is uh, definitely an icon of science, but also the peaceful use of space. And to all the people above us on planet Earth, it may there be peace on Earth. And thanks very much for helping us with an STS-109. Hope to be back. Thank you. Standing by for deployment. Deployment confirmed. The robot arm backing away from the Hubble Space Telescope. We went into this flight saying that this was one of the most challenging missions that, we were, that we've ever undertaken and that it would be uh, somewhat fortunate if we actually managed to accomplish all of the objectives. And yet here we stand today having accomplished uh, virtually every task that was on the nominal mission list and one or two additional ones that we threw in when it was convenient to do that. And the work again uh, puts us in a good posture with the Hubble Space Telescope 
to uh, continue its dramatic science. And while the telescope is heralded as probably the most productive science instrument that the agency has, has ever produced or that mankind has ever produced, uh, I'd like to also call some attention to the, to the synergy between the manned spaceflight program and the unmanned uh, operation of spacecraft. Today we uh, said goodbye to, uh, to Hubble with mixed emotions. Uh, we were glad that uh, servicing Mission 3B was successfully accomplished and that Hubble is now ready to go back to work uh, to continue to expand our knowledge of uh, the cosmos with its vastly increased capabilities. But uh, we also had that empty feeling that one gets when saying goodbye to a friend or a relative after a visit of uh, several days. Uh, after we saw Hubble kind of uh, disappear from, from view on the uh, uh, television coming down from the uh, orbiter as we were leaving the operations control center at Johnson, it was a very stirring sight to go out in the parking lot and uh, to see uh, Columbia fly overhead with, uh, with Hubble in trail. It was a pretty amazing thing. We did get everybody up on the flight deck. Uh, for one last look at the Earth from over 300 miles up right before the burn, and that was, uh, it was a great moment for us to kind of share the, as the mission came to a culmination. But I'm, I'm here to say I've always been a fan of great vistas when I'm on my motorcycle rides, and I've never seen vistas like we had from 350 statute miles up. There's always something that you think you may not foresee that, that gets in your way when you're actually up there. We had a few of those snags. We ran into a few small problems, but Due to the, the teamwork, I think, and the training that we'd received and the real-time analysis and interface with the ground, uh, we were able to overcome all those things, from the spacesuit malfunction, small problems on Hubble, to the Freon cooling loop. Looking back, it is amazing to me that everything went so well. And uh, I think one thing I want to make sure we don't do is this mission was very challenging, and just because it went almost picture perfect doesn't mean that it wasn't an incredibly challenging mission that we were very... Uh, fortunate to have done all our homework to make sure that uh, everything could work out the way it did. And it's that level of attention to detail and extreme uh, work ethic and work effort that is going to end up producing results like that. Hubble came out as you know, kind of an underdog. You know, it was almost written off by the general public prior to the first servicing mission. And on the first servicing mission we had real people, we had human beings going up and turning that story around completely. Uh, to the point that Hubble is the most productive uh, scientific machine, but also one of the most popular science instruments, maybe the most popular science instruments in the world, uh, and that the world has ever seen. And with each subsequent mission, there's some aspect that kind of uh, shows uh, the public that you know, people going up and, and working hard can make something uh, much better. And it's not just an American prize, uh, it's an international prize. I think that's appealing to the public, that people can go up in a spaceship with a bunch of tools and, and make something better that at one point was written off.